Over the course of five years, from January 23rd, 1990, to March 16th, 1995, a sadistic monster disguised as a human being named Keith Hunter Jesperson murdered eight women, and at one time took credit for up to 160 others as he traveled the mostly western United States working as a long-haul truck driver. He dumped the bodies of his victims in multiple states to confuse law enforcement, and Jesperson was years into his murders before anyone even realized a serial killer was responsible for the rapes and strangulations of multiple women. And it would have taken even longer for anyone to figure out what the hell was going on if Jesperson, who just couldn't tolerate someone else getting credit for one of his heinous crimes, hadn't scrawled confessions on bathroom stall walls and sent in poorly written cocky letters detailing his crimes to the media. Jesperson signed his anonymous admissions with smiley faces, which is how he got the nickname the Happy Face Killer. There was nothing actually happy about this large, roughly Ed Kemper-sized homicidal maniac. Finally, knowing authorities would soon be charging him with murders and hoping to avoid the death penalty, Jesperson confessed and his sick rampage was over. Today's tale is one of a man who, due to an unfortunate combination of possessing violent and sadistic tendencies, perhaps since birth, and then being raised in a violent home where murderous warning signs were not only ignored but actually encouraged, a troubled, cruel, and violent boy grew up to become a troubled, cruel, and murderous man in another true crime, serial killer edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, meat sacks. <laughs> Hail Nimrod, Lucifina, praise Bojangles, glory be to Triple M. I'm Dan Cummins, the Suck Sniper, the Suck Tater, the Master Sucker, and you are listening to Time Suck. Today's Time Suck is brought to you by Lisa. Love, Lisa. Lisa is a badass company with a big, big heart on a mission to give your body the rest it needs. With two awesome mattresses, plus accessories, and bases for a better place to sleep, they also believe in providing a better night's sleep for everybody. And to date, they've donated more than 32,000 mattresses to more than 1,000 nonprofits. That's right, more than 1,000 nonprofits. So get 15% off your entire order at lisa.com slash timesuck and use the promo code timesuck. That's L-E-E-S-A dot com slash timesuck, promo code timesuck, link in today's episode description. Had a blast in Denver. Thanks, Meat Sacks, for selling out those stand-up shows, the live podcasts, being an amazing, enthusiastic audiences who made the show so much fun. Heading to Dr. Grin's, Grand Rapids, Michigan, this weekend, November 21st to the 23rd. Another live time suck on the 23rd. Some of those shows already sold out, so thank you in advance. Heading to the Tacoma Comedy Club, Tacoma, Washington, December 5th through the 7th. Last live time suck of the year on the 7th. That'll be the last Ant Hill Kid suck. And then the last stand-up shows of the year are going to be the Spokane Comedy Club, December 26th through the 28th. A reminder that we're giving $3,500 of Patreon money this month to the Patriot Guard Riders. Thank you, Space Lizards. Uh, the Patriot Guard Riders are a 100% volunteer 501c3 that started back in 2005 in response to the Westboro Baptist Church Lunatics. Their mission is to ensure dignity and respect in memorial services, honoring fallen military heroes, first responders, and honorably discharged vets. To learn more, donate more yourself, please go to patriotguard.org. Uh, due to the popular popularity of previous tie-dyes in the store, we're having a new atomic tie-dye living in the suck shop right now. The Time Suck Atomic Tea is made out of 300% energy and 400% two-headed golden retriever fur and 1,300% three-eyed, four-tailed, six-wing, flying, nuke fish scales for radioactive superhero-like abilities. It comes in two awesome color combinations. Uh, what are those uh, abilities, by the way? Well, you have to wear the shirt to find out. Maybe you can cast webs like Spider-Man. Maybe you'll know pretty much everything and be indestructible and all-powerful like Dr. Manhattan, which would be way better. Uh, you'll for sure feel the power of Noop Nimrod, so hail Nimrod and his wisdom. Uh, thank you for ratings and reviews all over the web. Thanks for subscribing to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. We've almost reached 10,000 reviews on iTunes, and that really helps us get new listeners and subscribers. So hail Nimrod, praise Bojangles, and even better, a lot of the five-star uh, reviews are very funny. I try not to look too often, but I did look the other day because we're getting close to 10,000, and I saw that user Etched Threll wrote a review that really cracked me up. Subject line of just kill them in the following review. You know? There's a lot of people leaving one-star reviews calling Dan dumb. 
Do we need them? Like, what are they really contributing? These people are causing the deforestation problems with all the sticks they're shoving up their butts. I say we just killed them. <laughs> Thank you so much. That really cracked me up, you beautiful meat sack. And, and I'm guessing Etrel was referring to one-star reviews left by users like uh, Nalsteed, who one-starred Time Suck with a subject line of, and then writes, the latest episode about the Manhattan Project was so annoying that I could only make it 17 minutes in. Instead of saying the word, like a functioning member of society, <laughs> Dan Cummins replaced all the instances of the word with a computer-generated voice a la Stephen Hawking's, saying it instead. I keep trying to like the show, but interesting subjects are ruined by the host's immaturity and idiocy. Wow, Nal said, you sound like so much fun. Man, I bet you're a blast to hang out with. I bet everyone's like, man, I can't wait till Nal said shows up. He's a fucking champion. He's a champion of fun. Uh, here, here's what I, I really kind of thought about what I wanted to say to you uh, regarding that review. And here, here's, here's what it is. Don't keep trying to like this podcast. Find a humorless, fact-based show that plays it straight every episode. There are tons out there. Make that mature choice. Now said, oh, and just for good measure, nuclear, 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 nuclear. Hail Nimrod! <laughs> Still trying to like the show, Nalstead? Oh, so I hope you're at least laughing a little bit, you fucking stick in the mud. And now let's get refocused on some true crime. Keith Hunter Jesperson, the happy face killer. Researching Keith's childhood this week. That was too much fun for me, by the way. Uh, researching Keith's childhood this week, reading about terrible things he did to animals when he was growing up in a home with four other kids who did not do terrible things to animals. I wondered, can you truly just be born bad? I mean, most of the serial killers we've researched here on Time Suck have come from terrible homes. Think about the cartoonishly violent childhood of Henry Lee Lucas, one of the confession killers. Several were beaten so badly or, or molested or otherwise horribly mistreated that I'm amazed other kids raised in the, in the same homes as them didn't also grow up to become serial killers. Psychologist Terrence Leary, director of the Serial Killer Database Research Project, the largest non-governmental serial murderer database in the world, believes that childhood environment, aka nurture, not nature, plays the largest role in creating killers. He's looked at the lives of more than 5,000 killers going back to the 1950s, and he says, what we're finding is a great, great preponderance of abuse amongst serial killers. In every case I've looked at, there's some kind of horrendous home situation. However, despite Dr. Leary's assessment, not every killer comes from a horrendous home situation. Uh, Richard Cottingham, a serial killer who targeted sex workers in the Times Square area of New York City between 1967 and 1980, is an example of a killer who came from a happy home. The so-called Butcher of Times Square officially killed six people, but claims to have killed more than 80 before being apprehended. And there is nothing in Cottingham's childhood that points to homicidal rage. Historian Peter Vronsky is currently writing a biography on Cottingham and has spent more than 50 hours interviewing him and says that Cottingham's childhood was absolutely idyllic. His father was a vice president at Metropolitan Life Insurance in New York City. He has three younger sisters who used to absolutely adore him. All well-adjusted, no reports of family dysfunction. His mom was a homemaker housewife. He went to Catholic parochial schools. He was not molested. He claims to have uh, never been uh, molested, abused physically, sexually, or otherwise. He worked on computers for Blue Cross, Blue Shield for years, was well-liked by his coworkers. He got married and had three kids. Reported to be a great dad and a great husband. Also became known as the torso killer. Was he just born bad? Maybe not. Cottingham was hit by a car as a four-year-old, suffered brain damage to his frontal lobe, an area of the brain associated with desire to commit acts of aggression. So perhaps brain damage largely responsible for putting him on a path towards some kind of murder. But what about another serial killer who came from a good home, Randy Kraft? Randy's brain has been studied and, there, and scientists have found no abnormalities, no frontal lobe damage, and he was to investigators in court appointed psychologist knowledge, never abused in any way ever. And yet the scorecard killer very likely killed 64 people in a 12-year period in California. Born in 1946, he grew up in Orange County in the 50s and 60s, where he would bowl with his father, eat strawberries and whipped cream with his mother. With a high IQ of 129, Kraft took accelerated classes in high school, attended Claremont McKenna College, a top-tier liberal arts school. He has three sisters who all turned out fine. 
and for roughly a dozen years, Kraft tortured, burned, raped, and strangled young men, brutally torturing and killing young men, many of them teenage boys. He loved it. It was how he got off. He's a real piece of shit who's in San Quentin now. And there is no moment in his youth that you can point, point to and say, aha, so that's what fucked him up. A 16-year-old neighbor raped him repeatedly, and all his future rapes and kills were based on some kind of revenge fantasy. Nope. No one has been able to figure out why the hell he did it. Was he born bad? Maybe. It's a scary thought that you can raise someone the right way and still they can choose, possibly be genetically predispositioned towards choosing, becoming a sadistic killer. Andrei Chikatilo, the butcher of Rostov, he had a great childhood. In Ukraine, before I grew up and moved to Mother Russia, I live in a happy two-parent home, set in a beautiful, bustling Ukrainian city. A father was loving doctor who coached me in wrestling. A mother was homemaker who make apple pie and hug me every day and tell me she loved Chikatilo. Oh, JK, I grew up in war-torn uh, communist shithole. I watched many people die, watched many people starve in famine. Uh, Nazis by my side, shitty village, rape mother in front of me. I wet bed for many years because of brain lesion. Uh, mother sleep in the same bed, beat me, savage every time bed is wet. I uh, also curse with soft shame cock. It's only hard when hurting and stabbing. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> what is big deal? So I know Beaver Cleaver, childhood kid thing. Okay, so maybe Chikatilo is not the best example. But seriously, it does seem as if you can just kind of, you know, be born in a sense bad. Born with darker instincts than most of the rest of us. Born with a moral compass that does not have its true north set to any kind of kindness. Born with a compass that points to mostly cruelty. So was Keith Hunter Jesperson born with this kind of damaged compass? Yeah, to an extent, I think he was. And then that compass was put in a home that encouraged some of his crueler instincts instead of discouraging them. Ultimately, though, I still believe Keith still chose to do what he did. I believe all of the serial killers I've ever researched chose to do what they did. Because Keith went uh, for long stretches without killing, to me that proves he was capable of resisting his dark urges. We all have an urge to do something inappropriate sometimes, but most of us don't do it. I know that's harder for others because they're, uh, the part of their brain that says, no, you shouldn't do that, you know, uh, doesn't work as well. But really, I mean, if it didn't work at all, then these serial killers, wouldn't they just be killing like every single day? Wouldn't they just go out in like a crazy, bloody rampage where they try to kill like 40 people in a single day because they're just following that impulse over and they just can't help themselves? I think they can. I think it's harder for them, but I think they can. Uh, you know, despite maybe being born with a terrible moral, moral compass, despite not being raised in the best of homes, at the end of the day, Keith Jesperson, in my opinion, has no one to blame but himself for what he did. He chose to give in to his darkest urges. A lot of people died and died horribly because of his terrible choices. Will you agree at the end that he, uh, you know, chose to, uh, you know, the life he lived or that it was chosen for him? Well, let's, let's take a look at how Keith became a serial killer and find out in today's Time Suck Timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck Timeline. On April 6, 1955, Keith Hunter Jesperson was born in Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada, to Leslie and Gladys Jesperson. He was the couple's third child. His older sister, Susan, had been born in 1952, and his older brother, Bruce, was born in 1953. I'd never heard of Chilliwack until this suck, even though it's only about a seven-hour drive from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, home of the Suck Dungeon. Just over an hour's drive east of Vancouver, uh, Vancouver, Canada, less than 15 miles from the U.S.-Canadian border between British Columbia and Washington State, this metro area has about 100,000 people, about CDA-sized. And for Canada, it's got a pretty warm climate, actually average temperature-wise. It's the uh, warmest city in all of Canada. Chilliwack is like the Phoenix or Miami of Canada. Minus tons of scantily clad co-eds or beachgoers or weather that is actually really good. It has the best weather in all of Canada, which means it has average or maybe slightly above average weather for almost any other nation on Earth. Uh, sorry, Canadians, there's a lot I love about your country. Uh, weather is not one of those things. Your latitude coordinates make, uh, you know, make it so the climate not really that capable of approaching ideal. Too dark in the winter, too cold, gosh dang, I'm a heck. But Chilliwack, not bad weather-wise. Uh, it hit over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in August before, maybe just one time ever, but it did hit it. It even hit 90 one time in April, and the coldest it's ever gotten was uh, 16 degrees below zero one time in January. You know, all, all Fahrenheit there as well. The average low doesn't dip below freezing at any point in the year. Average high never gets... Uh, 
really above 80. According to a variety of Canadian city quality of life rankings with a much slower pace of life than Vancouver and a strong local economy, Chilliwack is a, quote, nice place to raise your family, which always reads as boring <laughs> to me, but maybe it's a good boring. And it's where Keith Jesperson's family began raising him. Keith was, again, the middle child. I'm sorry, I don't think I said it before. He was the middle child of two brothers, Bruce and Brad, and two sisters, Sharon and Jill. And according to Keith, he was tortured by all of them in one way or another. And according to all of them, Keith was the problem, and they did not torture him. They say he was a lying, sadistic little asshole, born born bad. Uh, now let's meet Keith's dad, Leslie. Apologies to male Leslie suckers, but that name never sounds right to me on a dude. Because I'd only met or heard of Lady Leslie's until the past few months. No, no, uh, no one I knew. You know, uh, I never came across a dude named Leslie. My brain just doesn't, you know, want to recognize it as a guy. Just, uh, it's like, it's it's like if I heard about a dude named Maria or Michelle and we just talked uh, about another dude, Leslie, two weeks ago in the Manhattan suck, General Leslie Groves. Anywho, anywho, thanks to the Yakima Washington Herald for the nice obituary to pull some details from so rare to find these details in these true crime sucks. Uh, Leslie died in Yakima at the age of 87 on May 18th, 2015. In the 1930s, Leslie's blacksmith father, Keith's grandfather, a man named Rebecca, migrated eastward from the family homestead in rainy British Columbia to the parched prairies of Saskatchewan. And kidding about Rebecca. His name is Art. Uh, After a few years, Art and his wife and Keith's grandma, Hank, I mean Florence, were beaten back to British Columbia by the Dust Bowl famine, known in Canada as as the Dirty 30s. Leslie Jesperson spoke about his Canadian childhood, called it a mix of Dickens and Dante saying, you never saw anybody work as hard as my dad and us six kids. We forge welded, shot horses, made logging equipment, anything that could be created with a forge, a bellows, and muscle. From kindergarten on, we worked alongside dad when we weren't in school. By the time I left home, I could squeeze 240 pounds, just like my dad. That was as high as our scale would read. If we got out of line, he hit us with a razor strap. There was a worn spot where it hit. Dad's strap was one hell of an educator. Uh, Leslie would take over his dad's blacksmith business, and then during World War II, he joined the Canadian Merchant Navy, sailing in the Aleutians, up there in Alaska, supplying the U.S. Air Force depots, or depots. 1948, Leslie married Keith's mother, Gladys Lorraine Bellamy, and Leslie started a business called Cruising Coffee Limited, selling coffee from trucks to businesses. He also started the Chilliwack Boxing Club and the Chilliwack Search and Rescue Squad, where he served as a search master for nine years. An avid outdoorsman, he climbed every mountain peak in southern British Columbia, including the rugged areas of airplane crash sites as part of search and rescue. He was the youngest alderman elected to the Chilliwack City Council, serving two and a half terms, resigning when he moved out of the country. He sounds resume-wise like a good dude, uh, maybe not so good, though. Keith would later blame his father for his extreme tendencies, saying his dad was an angry, violent, abusive alcoholic. Leslie always denied abusing anyone. However... Leslie also didn't consider uh, beating the shit out of his kids with a belt to be abuse. I was just giving them a proper strapping. Now, a little more about Keith's mama. Gladys Bellamy Jesperson grew up in a puritanical home in which the slightest mention of sex and sexuality was taboo. Lucifina is not pleased. Sounds, sounds fun. Sounds like a great place to spend your identity forming years. Lisa, Lucifina tells me that Gladys should have uh, ran away. Gladys' parents were so sexually conservative that she was even banished from the barn when the bulls bred and when the cows, uh, with their cows, and when any of the animals were giving birth. Right? You know, what if, what if she saw an, an animal penis or vagina? Oh my heck! She might grow up to suck every dick and play with every pussy in a hundred mile radius. Gosh dang! Good thing they, keep their, they kept her sweet little virgin away from all those devil dongs and Satan slits doing all that beast fucking. No one in the family, including her husband Leslie, would ever see Gladys naked, like ever. Her vagina was like a groundhog that never sees its shadow because it only comes out in the dark. Winter was always almost over around Gladys's Puxatani pussy. Solid dad joke right there, by the way. Then in 1995, after 37 years of marriage, uh, Gladys passed away of cancer, and all I can think about is her vagina finally being able to rest in peace where no one's trying to look at it because I'm a terrible person. Uh, the mortician probably had to close his eyes when he changed her out of the clothes she was wearing, you know, when she passed away. A- anyway, Leslie would save his wife years later. Her parents taught her to be ashamed of her body. I never saw one Bellamy touch another. And Keith would later say, I never hugged my mother and father. And they didn't hug me or my brothers and sisters. I never thought about this one way or the other. It's just the way we were. Ha! Huh. That doesn't sound good. A lady who thought sex was disgusting and a naked human body was shameful. A woman who did not uh, dole out any kind of physical affection. What? That woman? 
would raise a sexually motivated serial killer? Huh? Who would have thunk it? On the nurture side of things, when it comes to serial killers, it does seem like an awful lot of them come from sexually repressive homes, I've noticed. Uh, Keith and his four siblings remember their mother as being a workhorse and an immaculate housekeeper who held the family together. Dad's whole thing was making money, his daughter Jill recalled. Mom did everything else. Gladys Bellamy Jesperson was also a bit of a loner, preferring to spend time alone rather than spend it with others, even when the others were her own family. When Les uh, would take Keith and his five uh, and his siblings, uh, excuse me, and his four siblings camping each summer, Gladys was happy to stay home. Years later, in Keith's memory, he would remember her always as being posed primly on the couch, glasses reflecting uh, the TV screen, her knitting needles giving off little flashes of light. He thought he, he knew why his mother stayed home. She was dad's slave. She was relieved when he was gone. It gave her a little breathing room. So it sounds like a, a tense household he grew up in. Gladys took care of all the household duties, even designing and making her children's clothes, including pants and suits. So glad my mom did not make my clothes growing up. I love my mom, but she would have made the shittiest clothes ever. My mom is a long ways from perfectionist. Much more of a, eh, that's good. That's fine. Ah, that'll do. It's close enough. Kind of, kind of tight mom. I'd have been wearing some poorly crafted clothes to school. Pant leg much longer on one side than the other. Different colored socks. Long sleeve shirt that fits like a crop top. Underwear made out of fucking burlap. A uh, year after Keith is born, his younger brother Brad is born in 1956. I believe his uh, youngest sister Jill was born based on statements Keith later made in either 1957 or 1958. Locking in an exact date of birth for her is proven to be very difficult. I do know she's currently married to her second husband. I know her oldest daughter died unexpectedly last year at the age of 36. I do not know how old Jill is. Luckily, her age is not important when it comes to today's tale. So, so get out here, Jill. Go on, get. Ha, ha, ha. We don't need you. We don't need your age. 1961, young Keith hurts someone. Actually, Keith's very first memory is of hurting someone. In 1961, yeah, when he was six, he rolled a rock down a slide at a park and it hit his little brother Brad on the head. Splitting his head open, drawing blood, making him cry. Not really that unusual for a kid to do something like that, but it is interesting that that's the very first thing he remembers. Keith also remembers other kids making fun of him and giving him shitty nicknames. His brothers apparently were the worst, and because he was so big for his age, they gave him the nickname Igor, and it stuck and it bothered him greatly. Here, here we go with the nicknames again. Were a lot of these serial killers picked on a little more than the rest of us growing up, or were they just too fucking sensitive? about some teasing. I lean towards the latter. I feel like if more people could figure out how to be less sensitive, just kind of in general, but especially about like teasing and criticism, maybe work harder on thickening that skin, there'd be a lot less serial killers and just mass shooters and other sad sallies who are ticking time bombs or just you know a real bummer to be around. Who didn't get some shitty nicknames here and there growing up or get teased? In junior high, there were some kids that loved to call me Cumstain or cum bubble. Very clever variants of the last name of Cummins. Jason Sabasco, Mike Damon, Jason, some other fucking last name. It's killing me. I can't remember. Uh, you know, they love to toss those cum-based nicknames around. I can still see these kids' faces, like their junior high faces. Still remember their voices. I did my best not to uh, let on that the name calling got to me. I did my best to ignore those idiots. That's what my mom and grandparents told me to do, and that's what I did. Sometimes I'd throw back a little sarcastic laugh of just, ha, 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 genius. Oh, man, you guys are so clever. I haven't heard that one before. That's awesome. Instead of giving them the reaction they wanted, you know, I, I would have given them a fuck you or a beating, but I was very tiny and not good at fighting and scared and they would have destroyed me. So I handled it another way. And I've taught my kids to handle it the same way. You know, don't let idiots who tease you know that their words bother you or, or they will just harass you more. And who fucking cares what, you know, those kind of kids say because their opinions don't matter because they're silly, stupid little assholes. A uh, kid next door when I was growing up did not handle things well. You said anything about him, he started yelling at you, he started bawling his eyes out. Big dramatic reaction each and every time. So of course, everyone started to tease him all of the time. Couple words and you got to fucking sit back and watch the show. This kid ended up getting homeschooled because he couldn't handle it. But he, if, if, if he would have just reacted with, whatever, you guys are dumb, walked away, rolled his eyes, for sure would have been left alone. You can't control what people say about you. You can't control how you react. And based on what I've read about Keith, did not handle the teasing well. He handled it so badly, he started feeling like he was teased even when he wasn't being teased. He started identifying as a victim very early on. Hasn't let go of that identification since. Somehow, always everybody else's fault. He's always, you know, oh, poor Keith. Fucking hate that personality. Oh, woe is me. Go fuck yourself. Right? Stop fucking crying. Pull yourself up and get your shit together. 
Uh, here's some more un un unsolicited advice uh, regarding that. Don't let whatever life throws at you lead you uh, to identify primarily as a victim, right? Don't be the person who consistently rationalizes their own failures as being someone else's fault. Of course I didn't get that job. Nothing ever works out for me. Person hiring just didn't like me. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't do anything wrong. My car got repossessed because my credit card company fucked me over. You know, I didn't get into financial trouble because I spent too much money. No, they charged me too much interest. Even when there's truth to those thoughts, don't indulge them. Assume you could have done something to fix things, you know, yourself, you know, because you'll never read a biography or autobiography of a highly successful person who accomplished great things uh, because they blamed everyone else for their problems, right? It's, it's a loser's mentality that has helped no one ever. And Keith Jesperson had it in fucking spades. Why did he have it? I don't know. Maybe he wasn't born with the right cognitive potential. You can make that argument, but I don't like it too deterministic for me. I'm too much of a free will based meat sack to agree with that. You can make the argument that maybe no one taught him how to deal with a bit of bullying in a healthy way. Fine. But plenty of other people aren't bullied or are bullied, excuse me, and don't know how to handle it. And they, turn, they don't turn out to be serial killers. So I don't really like that either. I like the argument that he chose to react to what life threw at him consistently, very poorly and selfishly. Like a lot of future murderers, young Key started to kill and torture animals on a regular basis. No one made him do that. People teased him, didn't make him do that. He, he chose that. No one put a gun to his head and made him fuck up a cat. Uh, however, his dad did encourage that, which is super fucked up. And maybe if his dad hadn't encouraged his son to be a sadistic pet killer, if his dad hadn't have been one himself, maybe he wouldn't have grown up to become a serial killer. But you know what? He still chose to do it. Uh, Leslie, not a good dude when it came to teaching little Keith some empathy. Keith started hunting and killing neighborhood pets at a very young age. He kept hurting and killing pets right up to when he went to prison. Uh, Keith, as a young boy, enjoyed bashing in the heads of gophers with shovels, nailing stray dogs and cats to a board so he could throw knives at them. Holy fucking red flag. If I found out that one of my kids had nailed a cat or a dog to a board and then thrown knives at it, oh my God, they are going to a lot of therapy every week for a long time. And I'm getting a new lock for my bedroom door so I can sleep good at night. One of young Keith's favorite things to do when it came to pet torture was crimp a couple of cats' tails together with some wire, hang them over a rope and watch them claw each other to death. And, and if you do that or don't think that is a big deal, stop listening right now. Call a therapist because you are fucked up. Get help, you psychopath. According to Keith, his dad once witnessed him throw a cat against the pavement and then strangle it to death. And instead of being furious and sad and extremely concerned about his son's mental health, uh, Jesperson wrote that his dad was proud of how he dealt with it. He bragged to others about how Keith had gotten rid of the stray cats and dogs that were a problem in their trailer park where they lived. And now I'm reminded of the backwoods childhood horrors we talked about in the Confession Killer Suck when it felt like it, I was hearing some kind of dark version of Jeff Foxworthy redneck jokes. Instead of you might be a redneck, Jeff Foxworthy material, it was you might be a killer, bizarro world Foxworthy, Steph Cox scurvy jokes. If your daddy catches you strangling a cat to death in the trailer park driveway and gives you a high five instead of a whooping, you might be a killer. Uh, years later, Papa Leslie Cat Killer Jesperson would remember the incident differently, saying, Keith got rid of some stray cats and I didn't stop him. In fact, I almost persuaded him to do it. But I never taught him to kill. Never. My way was to drown him in a gunny sack. Once I saw him take a kid and smash it down, killed instantly, it made me shudder. What the fuck? <laughs> These guys, you know, the writing style you'll see later, uh, Keith would mirror his father's nonsensical it's like there, there's this writing style and just, just the lack of self-awareness these people have. That, that's an actual quote. He actually said, I never taught him to kill. And then also said in just the previous sentence that he did persuade him to do it, which I read as I told him to do it. And then he says that his way was to drown him in a gunny sack, which is killing them. So fuck Leslie Jesperson. Didn't turn his son into a serial killer, but he was a fucking maniac who loved drowning cats apparently. And then doesn't understand how that is kill. Ah, I don't understand these people. Keith's little sister, Jill, made frequent complaints about Keith's cruelty. But she was ignored because her dad was also cruel. Hard to get your dad to tell your brother to stop killing cats when your dad is also killing cats. Uh, she'd recall, dad and Keith both hated cats. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Keith bragged about wringing their necks and throwing them in the garbage. I was taken aback by this. You don't do that to animals. We never dreamed he would do it to people. And then later, Keith would write, all this did is spawn in me the urge to kill again. I began to think of what it would be like to kill a human being. Ah, uh, fun, right? Right. All the more reason not to condone your kids killing pets. I mean, we can all agree. That's a terrible parent move, right? We can agree that maybe you shouldn't like get off on fucking killing neighborhood cats. Gotta hope, I hope so. 
Uh, all this sad pet talk, uh, pet talk, <laughs> pet talk. Sounds like a weird, like this kind of like a, a weird, horrible version of a TED talk. Where instead of like important talks about, you know, things that could kind of help society, it's just fucking maniacs talking about killing cats. But all, all this sad talk does remind me uh, that we do need to take a quick little sponsor break. Today's Time Suck is brought to you by Ed Kemper's Pet Sickles. Do you like dead pets? Do you like the idea of dead pets' heads turning into fucked up popsicles? If you just answered yes to both of these questions, you are a monster. And you are going to love Ed Kemper's Pet Sickles. In honor of the Happy Face Killer, Kemper is offering you 50% off his Siamese, Tabby, Persian, and hairless flavors of Pet Sickles. Let Kemper himself tell you more. Hey, Mitch Jackson, mothers. First off, I don't see what all the fuss about Leslie is. is he sounds like the best dad ever. Keith was a lucky boy. Also, if you don't call 1-800-CAT-HEAD on a stick, you will face the wrath of my japples. Call now, mother. Yikes. <laughs> Jeez Louise, what the flip? That was scary. And of course, that was not one of our sponsors. Gosh dang. Uh, today's Time Suck is actually sponsored by For Hims. Uh, I'm extra glad For Hims is sponsoring today's show because I was reminded to order some more Good Night Wrinkle Cream, which has become part of my go-to sleep routine. And I like the Biotin gummies so much, I ordered more of those and ordered some immunity gummies and also some heart care gummies. They taste so good, it helps remind uh, me to take my vitamins every day. Maybe that makes me childish. But if I have to take a, a vitamin that just leaves a sour taste in my mouth, and I have to like feel like I have to eat before to kind of like swallow it down so it doesn't upset my stomach, or I can take a tasty gummy, I'm gonna go gummy. I get vitamins A, E, K, and thiamine to help my immune system. I get uh, uh, phy phytosterols. Oh, that's a tricky word, but I think I got it. They can help maintain normal cholesterol levels. I also get biotin, AKA vitamin B7, proven to strengthen hair and nails and promote healthy skin. And I get all that from my Forehams gummies. And if I ever get some uh, erectile dysfunction, I can get some ED medicine from for hims as well. And there's a decent chance that I will need that someday because 40% of men by age 40 struggle from not being able to get and maintain an erection. But the good news is the holiday season is upon us and hims has taken uh, or has the biggest Black Friday deal of them all. You cannot pull a Chikatilo and you can try a free online visit to get started with hims and hims connects you with real licensed doctors, FDA approved pharmaceutical products to treat ED. Save money by getting well-known generic equivalents to name brand prescriptions, answer all your questions in a confidential chat with their doctors, now with your doctor, and, and get your meds shipped directly to your door. You can try HIMS today, starting out with a free online visit. Go to forhims.com slash timesuckED. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash timesuckED. Forhims.com slash timesuckED. Prescription products subject to doctor approval require an online cons consultation with a physician who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. See website for full details, safety information. This could cost hundreds if you went in person to the doctor's office or pharmacy. Remember, that's 4 slash timesuckyd. Link in today's episode description. Now back to Keith Jesperson's disturbing and dysfunctional childhood. Keith's father reportedly drank heavily, dominated his family through violence. Leslie would later say, I didn't hurt any of those kids. Sure, when they got real unruly, I'd take a strap to them. Uh, and throw them in a big old gunny sack and toss a sack into the river for no more than a few minutes to get their attention. But no, I never heard him. And of course, Le Leslie never said that. Uh, but he did deny ever abusing them while also admitting to whipping them with a leather strap. In an interview, he said, when I was a kid, I got strapped harder than any of them. And I didn't grow up to be a serial killer. A lot of kids could use a little beating nowadays. I was strict, but a good father. I raised my kids like I was raised. And you know what? I'm a little torn on this statement because I do think there are some kids who could use some corporal punishment. But you got to know how to, to, how to not take it too far. Like, I know a lot of people will disagree with me on this, but a couple swats on the bottom designed to scare more than injure will for sure get some kids' attention, get them to change their behavior for the better. Classic BF Skinner behaviorism. Just like shocking a lab rat will get that rat to engage in behavior that results in it, you know, being shocked less frequently, negative reinforcement, many a kid has cooled their jets because of a well-timed spanking. My dad caught me pushing a smaller kid into a mud puddle when I was about five years old, gave me a good spanking for being a bully. And that lesson has stuck with me to this day. Never did that again. That spanking for sure helped me become a better person. But you can't do it too much. If I would have got spankings left and right, you know, then the only lesson I would have learned was that my dad was a spank happy asshole. Showbiz. Swat those fat bottoms. That's how they do it in Hollywood. Uh, but seriously, it's true. You know, I think. Also, if you're going to dole out negative reinforcement, you know, don't just shock the rat when it makes a mistake. Also reward it when it behaves correctly. Mix in a lot of hugs and great jobs with the occasional spanking, right? Dole out some positive reinforcement. But I don't think Leslie did that. Leslie, you know, he wasn't a hugger. Uh, didn't hug the kids. When talking about his serial killer son, Leslie would say, we always knew he was different. 
but we never thought he would kill. Other than, I guess, a shitload of cats. Uh, looking back on Keith's life, knowing all he's done, makes me wonder if there was anything that prompted his bizarre behavior. He says it's all my fault. He says, Dad, you and your belt made me a killer. That's bull and he knows it. No kid ever had a better upbringing. Easy, Leslie. Easy. Lots of kids had a better upbringing. You know, hugging cat, drowning leather, strap happy fucking weirdo. According to several different sources, Keith would often get severely punished by his father, often get a big ass whooping right in front of other kids. Lots of other kids, yeah, had better upbringings. 1964, at the age of nine, Keith was involved in an incident involving a beating at the hands of his father that he claimed would trouble him for many years later. He would say, I got into a fight with a boy my age. His mother yelled at me to get off her property and quit picking on her kid. She was yelling, fuck this and fuck that. I yelled back that she was a bitch. I was riding my bike home when the boy's 16-year-old brother jumped out of his car, slugged me, and kicked me twice with his pointy-toe cowboy boots. Then he drove over my bike and wrecked it. My father didn't like getting dragged out of a city council meeting by a constable and told uh, that his son Keith had called a bitch a bitch and a few other names, and the bitch was filing a slander suit. Dad was embarrassed and angry. He'd been drinking since noon. He drove straight home. Before mother could tell him the whole story, his fist struck me down and he dragged me into his bedroom. He worked me over with his belt till I couldn't scream anymore. Kept yelling that I made a fool of him in front of Madam Chairperson. Mom finally pulled him off and said, Leslie, Keith was not at fault. She showed him the bruise where Brian's brother slugged me. And that made him call Brian's mother and cuss her out worse than he, she'd cussed me. He slammed the phone down, turned to me and said, let that be a lesson to you. Mom said, don't you want to apologize to Keith? And dad said, he probably had it coming anyway. I didn't know what to think. Oh, the classic, he probably had it coming anyway. Tossed around by shitty parents the world over. Uh, what was that again, Leslie? No kid ever had it, a better upbringing? Uh-huh, right. Starting, in later, uh, starting later in 1964, maybe even early 1965, when Keith was nine, he started frequently playing with, or according to Keith, was forced to play with a mischievous boy named Martin, who Keith started to constantly blame for any trouble Keith would get into. This is the real beginning of that narrative, that nothing is ever Keith's fault. Good old victim identification, right? Keith was just a well-balanced cat crushing goody two-shoe. It was Martin who was the bad seat, the evil influence. And when Martin would get Keith in trouble, Leslie would work Keith over with the belt. Damn you, Martin! Then in 1966, when Keith was 11, he decided to rectify this recurring, ongoing Martin situation by beating the fuck out of Martin. He beat the kid unconscious. He'd later say, I would have killed him if I hadn't been stopped. Not a doubt in my mind. I wasn't surprised to get the belt. That was one time when I was guilty. So, first attempted murder by the age of 11. If you felt that beating the kid from the trailer next door unconscious was totally justified because he sometimes got you in trouble, you might be a killer. Uh, later, Keith would write that this was a watershed moment for his early development, saying, that's when I began to think of myself as two people, one watching the other. When I was kicking Martin's ass, a gentler part of me stood by and watched. Maybe I'm still that way. When I'm taking care of a serious problem, I feel like I'm on the outside looking in. I can honestly say that the person that beat Martin was not the real me. I would never hurt another kid no matter what he did. It wasn't my nature. But that day, I, I just kind of stepped aside and let the bad side take over. It was the same with the women I killed. My murders happened in slow motion, and later I would fantasize about what I should have done. I'd be thinking, if only I could do it all over, I would do it different. But the girls ended up just as dead. Ah, how convenient. I didn't do anything bad. I'm the good guy. I'm really. I'm the victim of the super naughty Keith. That sometimes takes over my body and makes me do horrible things I don't even want to do. Man, you're lucky you're not me. Must be nice not to have a super naughty demon personality part of you take over your body sometimes when you can't even help it. And there's absolutely nothing you could even do about it. These fuckers. They so rarely take responsibility for their shit. I watched numerous interviews uh, of Keith on YouTube, and he is especially hateable. Also in 1966, when Keith was 11, a few sources say Keith's father started to charge him rent for room and board to teach him the value of money. Keith would uh, come to find out that the other Jesperson person kids would not charge rent, including this detail because, yeah, again, it's listed in numerous sources. Uh, it, it does, you know, come from Keith. And Keith, like Henry Lucas, knows Tool. You know, he did love to lie. I don't know if I buy it. That would be pretty messed up, though, <laughs> if that was true, to find out that you were the only one of, you know, five kids, charge room and board uh, growing up. At the very least, this shows, you know, Keith saw himself as the odd one out in the family. He saw himself as the black sheep, especially with his father. 
Uh, Keith had a disturbing encounter with a pedophile early in his childhood. Those sick fucks seem to have to just show up in every uh, one of these stories. He said that uh, when he was around the age of 11, he and some schoolmates were playing at a neighbor's dairy farm, and that's when some farmhand offered to advance uh, their sexual education. Keith said, he stripped and made us do the same. He said that sex was touching our peepees together, and he started to play with his pecker until it got larger and erect. Then he asked us to touch him. He was making a move on a boy when I grabbed my clothes and ran. He yelled at me not to tell anyone. I thought, don't worry, I won't. Later, I asked the boy how he liked it. He said that it hurt, and he told his father what happened. His father told him to keep quiet. The dairyman did it to him doggy style, and after it was over, he forced him to lick his pecker. I was disgusted and didn't want to hear about it. Why? Why is there so many of these sick fucks out there? Right? Just don't fuck kids. Why why has so many kid fucking tales come up in these stories? Do we need to put billboards, signage all around the country, all around the world? Hey, you, don't text and drive. And also, don't fuck kids. Your hostess will see you soon. Please, while you wait, don't fuck any kids. Please turn off your phones. Don't talk during the movie. Enjoy your film. And for God's sake, don't fuck kids. Uh, Around this time, Keith also used a BB gun to shoot an, quote, overweight neighbor as she bent over to pick some raspberries. And he says, I got caught and she took me straight to dad. She was limping and crying, putting it on. Dad tried to keep a straight face. He told her he couldn't punish me till he got a good look at the evidence. After he finished laughing at his own joke, he gave me a light spanking in front of her. This time he used his hands instead of the belt. If your father once asked the neighbor lady to show him where you shot her in the ass with the pellet gun and then laughed in her face in front of you, you might be a killer. Uh, Keith almost killed another child around this time. There would be a second attempted murder in Keith's childhood. Another boy who'd been bullying him for a while held Keith's head underwater while he was swimming at Cultus Lake. While he was, his family was on vacation in the Willamette National Forest, not too far from Bend, Oregon. And Keith said, he held my head below the surface, let me come up from air, then pushed me down again. After five or ten minutes of this, I started to see black. I believe my life was spared by the counselor that jumped in the pool and pulled him off. Well, that kid fucked with the wrong Canadian. Keith immediately plotted revenge. He said that later, at the public swimming pool, I held him under till the lifeguard pulled me off. I had every intention of drowning him. I guess you could say it was a second murder attempt of my childhood. The other was that little bastard, Martin. It was like I had only one way to fight, all out. I'm still thinking about Martin. I wonder where that dude is today. I wonder if, I wonder if Martin knows how badly the happy face killer wanted to end his life. In 1967, the Jespersons moved to Yakima, Washington. Leslie got some type of job that revolved around working on agricultural equipment, specifically working with equipment using apple and hop harvesting. The Yakima Valley produces over 75% of all the hops used in the United States. So if you love beer, you may not know it, but you also love Yakima. A lot of apples grown uh, around this city in the Yakima Valley. It builds itself as the Palm Springs of Washington. Yakima located in South Central Washington State, about 250,000 people in the metro area. Long list of notable people coming out of Yakima. Uh, Keith Jesperson, not among them. Colleen Atwood, one of my wife uh, Lindsay's, Queen of the Sucks, uh, favorite costume designers for film and TV, hails from Yakima. This is a woman who's been nominated for a dozen Academy Awards, won four for films like Chicago and The Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Legendary comedian Sam Kinison, born in Yakima. Actor Kyle MacLachlan from Twin Peaks, Sex and the City, Desperate Housewives, Portlandia, and so much more, born and raised in Yakima. Seems like a nice place to grow up. A little bit warmer than old Chilliwack. It was between 1968 and 1969, during Keith's seventh grade year, that Keith's new friend, Tom Hager, introduced Keith to the joys of shoplifting. Keith now starts to get used to breaking the law. You know, gets off on getting away with breaking the law. Gets better at rationalizing illegal behavior. He's not doing anything wrong. If stores didn't want him to steal, why did they charge so much? Also in 1969, at the age of 14, Keith shoots a Rambo-style arrow with an exploding tip at the home of one of his teachers. If you not only figured out how to make an arrow with an exploding tip, but also actually fire it at one of your teacher's homes when you're 14 years old, you might be a killer. Uh, Keith would say of the incident, I used a .30-06 shell casing, pulled out the lead, filled it with gunpowder. I'd ran the staff of the arrow into the mouth of the shell, wrapped the casing with baling wire. For a detonator, I used a nail and a piece of copper tubing. When I shot those arrows into a piece of half-inch plywood, they blew out a hole the size of your fist. I decided that wasn't big enough. So, Keith not turning out to be the best kid. A classmate would later recall he could be bright when he wanted to be, but then he would do something stupid. He'd be too kind or too mean, too generous or too stingy. You never saw the in-between. 
I always wondered if he was in control of his own brain, if he might have had brain damage. He sure acted like it. And he's an odd duck. In addition to his animal cruelty, which continue, by the way, dude was starting to, uh, you know, just continue to kill whatever critters cross his path. You know, there's theft, Rambo shit. He also started setting, uh, you know, fires. In an interview, he'd, he'd say he always found an odd comfort in watching fires dwindle down to the last ember. I'd asked to be the one who lit the burn barrel. I found that aerosol cans blew up in fire. I'd act like it was an accident when I threw in a half can of hairspray. A ball of flame would jump up like a miniature atomic bomb. Butane lighters exploded too. Campfires were so soothing, I'd sit there for hours after everybody else had turned in. Sometimes I'd find bugs and toss them in, hear them crackle and split their skins. Or I'd throw an old log full of bugs in the flames and watch them scramble. <laughs> Jesus Christ. This guy, just a walking red flag for later murder. Uh, adding to Keith's mental struggles was also an above average amount of rejection. Keith was apparently rejected by every girl he liked, never went to prom or any of the dances. Smart girls. I bet he creeped them the fuck out. Hey, would, would you ever want to hang out after school sometime? Maybe we could, you know, go set something on fire or like throw a bunch of bugs in the flames and listen to them crackle and split. No? Huh, okay. Hey, uh, what are you doing this weekend? Would you, would you want to go find some cats and slam them into the pavement until their eyes pop out of their heads? No? What? I, I'm crazy? Where, where are you going? <sighs> Women! They're so confusing. Later around the age of 14 or 15, during a 10-week trip across country to visit his uncle Ivan, a minister on Fogo Island off of Newfoundland, Keith did finally find a little romance. He found himself making out with the girl who was four years older than he was. And then he was grossed out when he saw the blue veins and white skin of her naked breasts. Her pasty white flesh made me want to throw up, he said. Uh-oh. Violent and sexually conflicted? That's not a good combo. This feels like mom's insanely puritanical view of sexuality rubbing off on little Keith here. Keith had another incident with another girl on the same trip where she was into him. He didn't make a move, and then he got made fun of. He would later write about it. Apparently, no one on the island could keep a secret, and pretty soon, dad was talking about Keith's girl troubles. He rubbed it in until everybody was laughing and giggling about the naive Keith. How dumb. How backward. I ran down the dock and crawled under some fishing nets. For hours, I pretended to be the creature from the Black Lagoon, waiting to ambush the next person who came along. That's how angry I was. Luckily, no one showed. What a fucking weirdo. Jesus, remember what I said about teasing earlier? Taking some ribbing, right? Fuck, this guy just couldn't take it on this thin-skinned psychopath. Instead of hiding under a dock for hours, pretending to be a monster and waiting to attack somebody, you know, he could have just, I don't know, laughed it off. And went about his life. Keith also, uh, Keith also lost his virginity at the age of 14. Uh, later in his writings, he would somehow describe this interaction as rape, which to me seems like him trying to, I don't know, maybe justify later violence towards women. He wrote, Dad took me on a fishing trip to the Washington coast, and on our last evening, I was walking on the beach when I came upon a woman sitting next to a campfire. We sat and talked, and she told me how handsome and tall I was. We kissed, and after a while, she began to take off my clothes. She grabbed my hand and guided my fingers into her, opened up the blanket and flashed some tit. I got hard and she said, that'll do nicely. Did she really say that? Uh, she laid me on my back and climbed on top and popped my cherry, raped me over and over until I couldn't get it up anymore. As I walked her to her pickup, she told me she'd be there tomorrow night. But dad said I had to head back to Sela the next day. That weekend put my sexuality into overdrive. Now I knew how exciting it was to be seduced by a loving and willing woman. Now there was nothing else on my mind. Dude, do you not fucking know what rape means? What are you talking about? Loving and willing woman, how great it was, overdrive, yet she raped me. This reminds me of like his dad earlier. You know, I never told him to kill. I mean, sure. I showed him how to hold cats underwater until they were dead. But I never told him how to kill cats. You know what I mean? No, we don't know what you mean, you fucking lunatics. Uh, more sad childhood stuff would occur in 1971 when Keith was 16. Uh, Keith's companion for many years and his, quote, only friend, for quite some time, according to him, was a Labrador retriever named Duke. Apparently, this was the only animal that Keith was nice to, but the dog met a violent end anyway. Keith's dad shot it. Keith would later say, I went nuts. Duke was a member of the family. To me, killing him was murder. Duke was my closest friend for 14 years, and when dad shot Duke, he might as well have shot me. Keith remembered his father saying, he must have gotten some coyote poison, Keith. He was dragging ass. Didn't look good. I had to shoot him. Uh, or, or, could have taken him to a vet. 
Could have taken him to one of the many veterinarians working in and around Yakima, you animal-hating piece of shit. If your daddy once shot your beloved canine companion of 14 years because he was, quote, dragging ass, you might be a killer. Uh, to add to Keith's mental instability, he seems to have suffered a severe head injury in 1973. As we've learned from previous serial killer sucks, early signs of sadism, plus a rough and rugged home life, plus a traumatic brain injury equals a much better than average chance of someday becoming a serial killer. Keith was always getting teased about not being able to reach the top of a 25-foot rope Yakima kids had, had to climb for wrestling practice. Over and over again, he couldn't do it. Then finally, he made it damn near the top, and then the rope pulled loose from the ceiling, and he fell roughly 25 feet to the hardwood floor, hitting hard enough for witnesses to say he literally bounced back up into the air, violently slammed his head into the ground. He, of course, went to the nurse's office. Uh, there's no record of hospitalization for this accident, but it does seem like he went to the hospital uh, because his family did receive $30,000 in compensation from the school when Leslie threatened legal action. In 1973, Keith graduated high school. He was valedictorian, and he was quickly accepted into Stanford, uh, JK. Uh, he graduated 161st in his class, 161st in a class of 174, had a GPA of 1.72, which means he got a lot more Ds than A's, B's, and C's. His IQ was recorded as being 102, right in the middle of the average range. So while he was no genius, you know, had he applied himself, he could have gotten much better grades. Keith recalls just fucking around the whole time in school, not reading any books and cheating just to get C's and D's. Probably sent a, uh, spent a significant portion of his classroom time uh, daydreaming about what new horrible shit he could do to neighborhood pets. College was not part of Grown Keith's plan after high school. This champion of a meat sack uh, didn't even move out of his parents' trailer for a couple years. Stayed at home, working odd menial jobs. 1975, 20-year-old Keith, still living with his parents, got his first taste of killing larger animals when he began dragging stray dogs, and of course, beloved cats, uh, into a field near the park where he would beat them to death with a shovel, Strangle them, strangle them with his bare hands or shoot them with his BB gun, and he loved it. Jesperson would later brag to a reporter, I was Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was like I was playing war. When I looked at those dogs, they would squat and pee. They'd be so scared, they'd tremble. My God, this guy was such a fucking loser. Yeah, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, back when Arnold used to live in Yakima in a trailer park. You know, when his parents, uh, or with his parents, you know, and when he was, uh, you know, just beating stray dogs to death. I'm so powerful. Look at my muscles, you little girly dogs. Look at my massive pectorals that were almost developed enough to make it to the top of the wrestling rope, you little girly cats. Tremble with fear, small hungry animals that just want a human to be kind to you. If when you're 20, you still lived in your mama's trailer, and beating neighborhood pets to death made you feel like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You might be a killer, and you're for sure a douchebag. Uh, the power he held over animals, Jesperson, uh, as he would later say, got him hot. You come to the point where killing something is nothing, Jesperson said. It's that same feeling. Whether he was strangling a human being or an animal. Uh, he said, you've already felt the pressure on the throat of them trying to grab air. You're actually squeezing the life out of these animals, and there isn't much difference. They're going to fight for their lives just as much as a human being will. Uh, after hearing that, Bojangles just started putting a plan together to break into the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem, where Keith is currently being held to use his one front paw to choke the fucking life out of this piece of shit. Uh, Bojangles is telling me he's going to let go of this dude's windpipe just long enough so he can piss in his mouth until he can start to drown him. And then before he, you know, drowns to death, he's going to go full Albert Fish and finish him off with some peanut butter butter. And some showbiz. This dude was the most ruthless dude we have come across thus far in the suck first when it comes to animal cruelty. Worse than even Ed Kemper putting heads on sticks, mother. Uh, Jesperson killed those dogs and cats with his bare hands, strangled them, hit them with blunt, you know, or sharp objects, burned them alive, poisoned them, forced them to kill each other. He, he would have made old school Michael Vick sick with all the shit he did to animals. In at least one instance, he slowly killed a tomcat with a BB gun saying, I cornered this big tom and shot him over and over till he finally just laid there and bald, with each new BB shot into his flesh. God damn it. I shot BBs up his ass and lower body parts. I used rocks to smash his paws. Fuck! Poked his flesh to make him jump and took 56 BBs before he died. My God! You are almost certainly going to start killing people if you're that sadistic to animals. What in the fuck? When he was later interviewed about his cruelty to animals, Keith often brought up his father. Uh-huh. And this next 60 or so seconds of Keith's interview is actually uh, rougher 
the one I just when I just read. Might want to skip ahead. Not kidding. Uh, and I and I cut a fair amount of like his writings from this because they were. I was like, no, no, this this gives the gist. I don't I don't want to fucking read any worse than this. So just imagine that as bad as these things are. Uh, he said, Dad said you're you're going to control the area, Keith. If an animal becomes a pest, shoot it. I got real good at hitting dogs on the run. I bought a CO2 pistol and accidentally shot a neighbor's dog and had to pay the vet to dig out the pellet. After that, I took a few strays to the pound, but they found their way back. I decided to take no prisoners after that. I killed the pest with whatever I had at hand. Hammer, sickle, scythe, screwdriver, shovel, bare hands. I take a dog into the sagebrush, give him a good kick, and then open fire with my 30-30. I toss the suckers out of the window at 50 miles an hour. And he just goes on and on and on. I baited trash cans with poisoned meat, collected bodies in the mornings before anybody got up. One night I killed seven cats and kittens. I caught a dog in our garbage, used a hook scythe to cut off his head. I threw cats in the incinerator. I set one on fire and it ran for the barn, flames everywhere. Another cat got into our burn barrel. I put a piece of plywood over the top, poured in gasoline and threw in a match. The cat howled until it was cooked. It made me hot and hard. I enjoyed the feeling of power. I liked taking a cat or dog into my room and poking it with a stick. There was no running away from Keith, the Avenger. I knew it was wrong to hurt dumb animals, but I did it anyway. It was just an urge. If you refer to yourself as Keith, the Avenger for, ah, oh, fuck it. Keith, Hunter Jesperson did grow up to be a killer. What a piece of shit. I'm, I'm done, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Be sure and tip your weight, Steph. Steph's out. Steph's had it with this guy's childhood. Uh, when Jesperson was 20, or I guess a childhood and young adulthood. When, Je- when Jesperson was 20, he somehow got married. Uh, to Rose Huckey. Uh, she was 18. They got married on August 2nd, 1975. Uh, uh, Keith's brother, Bruce, was the best man. And according to Keith, the couple fought all night throughout their honeymoon. Or I'm sorry, fought all throughout their honeymoon. Uh, the fighting started their wedding night when Keith told Rose he wasn't going to be able to get fully hard unless he could either set a cat on fire or shoot a uh, you know pellet gun up a dog's ass. Uh, J.K. That's not why they fought. They did fight. About his marriage to Rose, Keith would write, two weeks before the wedding, I said, Dad, I can't marry Rose. I don't love her. He says, I've already invited the relatives. <laughs> you probably, don't disgrace your friend. What a terrible thing. I, I've heard, and I've heard this story from like other people too. What? No, you have to get married. We sent out the invitations. That is so fucking dumb. Oh, yeah. You know, you have to commit the rest of your life to something that's doomed to fail. We, said, we have cake. We have cake ordered. Come on. Uh, he says, Rose wanted out of her house in the worst way. I was her ticket to freedom from her mother and three brothers. She said we'd be married on her 18th birthday. I still didn't know how to say no. It almost didn't happen. At the rehearsal at Denny's restaurant, I was thinking how much I would like to run off with the maid of honor, Rose's friend, Pam, and I gave her a friendly kiss. Rose said, why'd you do that? I said, she kisses better than you. So that's, that's fun. Uh, to hear right before you get married. I felt penned in and wanted to get out of there, but it was too late. I was smothered by Rose and my relatives. This dude, fuck. Ah, it's everybody else's fault. It's everybody else's fault he got married. Man, he just couldn't, he couldn't do anything about it, you know? It's not like he was a 20-year-old grown-up. <sighs> These people, they would go on to have three kids, two daughters and one son. Date of births don't seem to be listed anywhere I can find, but daughter Melissa was born in either late 1978 or early 1979. Brother Jason was born roughly two years later. Sister Carrie was born roughly a year after Jason. Keith does seem to love his kids. He still gets visits in prison from at least Melissa. Claims to have been an excellent father. You know, he never set any of his kids on fire. Never shot up, uh, you know, a pellet gun up the asses of any of his kids. So, you know, I guess he wasn't that bad. He barely killed cats in front of him. More on that later. <sighs> God, he's a terrible dad. The, uh, the family struggled financially. Moved around from Yakima to the little town of Toppenish, which is 20 miles outside of Yakima. Moved to various other little towns in Washington State and British Columbia. He stopped driving to work in some mines for a while in Canada before getting fired and returning to driving. Got hired on with a construction company, then drifted on to two other jobs. Managed an apartment complex for a little while in exchange for half off his monthly rent. Eventually settled back into a career in long-haul trucking. And, and I know we have a lot of long-haul uh, truckers uh, as time suckers, by the way. Appreciate you. Drive safe. Don't let any of the nonsense distract you into an accident. Hail Nimrod. Uh, for years, outside of killing more animals brutally, when the wife and kids weren't watching mostly, uh, Keith lived a fairly normal life. He was cheating on his wife uh, on a regular basis when he was out of town in long hauls, but he wasn't killing anyone, and he wasn't taking the strap to any of his kids th- that I can find records of. He wasn't encouraging his kids to beat neighborhood stray animals to death that I'm aware of. 1985, when he's 30, Keith's mom Gladys dies of cancer, and he doesn't seem to care. He creeps out most of his family by seeming to think it was funny. 
He expressed no sadness whatsoever. Siblings and others remember him laughing a lot that day, being pretty jovial, making a lot of jokes about how mom was just ashes now. Keith the Comedian. Sounds like he bombed that day. Gotta know your audience, dude. Funeral's a tough crowd for mom is dead now jokes. Man, I thought our uptight mom couldn't get any stiffer. <laughs> Have you tried moving one of her arms? <laughs> oh, that stick up her ass seems to have spread to the rest of her body. I mean, right? Come on. Nobody? Get it? Her whole body is as stiff as a board now. You know, like a, like a board is basically made out of sticks. Ah, oh, you guys suck, man. This shit is gold, people. Three years later, after more somewhat normal life, in 1988, while still married to Rose, Keith meets someone else. Jesperson would later write about it. At a truck stop south of Weed, California, I met a skinny little brown-haired waitress named Peggy Jones. I flirted with her for a while, got her phone number. Then I had to leave for my run north. A few weeks later, I stopped in Weed for a 10-hour layover and called Peggy's number in Dunsmere. I dropped my trailer, ran bobtail to her place to pick her up. All I was looking for was a quick lay on the way back to Seattle. Class, nothing but class with Keith. Later, we got into the back of my truck and had sex. Then I drove her to the truck stop and had sex again and drove her home and had sex one more time. Peggy was the only woman I've ever met who could keep up with me and still want more. She asked, will I ever see you again? I said, in a few days, and I kept my word. I told her I wasn't married. She said she was divorcing her husband and he had custody of their two kids. Since Dunsmere and Weed were right in the middle of my north-south runs, I started spending my sleeping time with her. Pretty soon I was falling in lust with her and then in love. I was spending more time with her than with my wife and kids. So, clearly Keith and Rose's marriage is not going real gangbusters right now. Keith's daughter, Melissa, around nine or 10 years old at this time, would later recall their parents fighting a lot, mostly about money. And Rose was suspecting Keith of cheating. Uh, but they stay married for a little bit longer. Keith and his family eventually moved to Eastern Washington, take up residence in a trailer park. Not much more than an hour's drive from where I'm recording here in the Suck Dungeon. Keith gets a, a job at a long-haul trucking outfit in Cheney, Washington, a little college town that's the home of Eastern Washington University near Spokane. Uh, the family lives in Spokane. Over towards Cheney, they, the move doesn't alleviate any tension in the marriage. And in 1989, after 14 years, Rose decides she's had enough. While Jesperson is on the road, she packs up her and her children's belongings and then uh, goes over to live with her parents at their house in Spokane, Washington. In 1990, Keith and Rose's divorce is finalized and Keith moves to Oregon. Jesperson stays in the picture, sees his children sporadically, visiting them when work brings him through Spokane. Here's what Keith would have to say about this period of his life. I was living in my girlfriend's little ranch house in Portland, just off Interstate 84. I'd left my wife and kids for Peggy Jones, and now the bitch was out on the road, screwing another trucker. Five days after Christmas, she'd gone to a truck stop and started flirting again. Didn't come home that night and didn't call. Nothing new for Peg. Just after New Year's, the phone rang and the operator said, I have a collect call for Keith Jesperson. It was Peggy, telling me she was in Knoxville with her new boyfriend. She ordered me out of her house. Move, she said. If you're going to stay there, you're going to pay me rent. She told me to send her money, called me an asshole, and hung up. I felt like punching somebody, even though it wasn't my nature. I was sitting out front stewing when I spotted an alley cat. Jesus Christ! I lured it into the house and prodded it into a corner where it couldn't get away, then I strangled it. What in the fuck? He's, he's so... He's, God, why is he alive? Uh, I felt like punching somebody, but that wasn't my nature. Right, because you're such a gentle soul, Keith. Such a decent guy. And how crazy was it that Peggy screwed you over? You're the victim again. Weird that the lady that you had a long time affair with behind your wife's back would then have an affair behind your back. What a tough break. This guy can't catch a break. Uh, Keith's frustrations with women quickly turned into the beginning of his murder spree. Keith's first known victim was Tonja Bennett near Portland, Oregon. On Tuesday evening, January 23rd, 1990, the pretty 23-year-old decided to go out for a few drinks, meet up with a few of her friends. It was a cold, damp night, Pretty typical weather for that time of year in Portland, Oregon. After grabbing her purse and umbrella, she climbed into her car, drove towards the B&I Tavern, one of her favorite haunts on Portland, Oregon's southeast side. She had a great time laughing, getting drunk. Creepy Keith is there watching her from the shadows. At first, Tanja never paid much attention to Keith, but he'd been watching her all night. Eventually, Keith walked over to the pool tables area where Tanja had been watching the players with a glass of beer in his hand, and he introduced himself to her and offered to buy her a drink. She accepted an unbeknownst to her, he had, uh, she had set into motion a series of events that would ultimately end her young life. Jesperson was known to use a number of aliases, often a variation of his own name, and all likely to use an alias that particular night. The 34-year-old started to make poor Tanja laugh and enjoy his company. 
Friends and family would later say that she was easy to befriend and sadly easy to take advantage of. She was described as mentally slow by her family. She trusted everyone. She didn't know how horrible the world could be. At one point, Jesperson offered to buy her dinner. She accepted. And then when he checked his wallet to see how much money he, he had, uh, he realized he didn't have enough cash. Oh, oh my heck, gosh dang. He told Tanja that he had more money at home, invited her to come back with him and get it. Tanja agreed. When they got to his place, she followed him inside, unaware that his quest for cash was just a way to get her alone with him. Here is Jesperson's account of what had happened. I was fascinated at her trust in a total stranger. Maybe it was because she was half drunk. I realized that I was in full control. I came up behind her and kissed her neck. She ran straight for the door. I grabbed her and said, I guess sex is out of the question. When she didn't answer, I laid her on the mattress and kissed her. That is some rapey shit. Kissing someone on the neck, they run for the door, and then you say, oh, oh, I guess sex is out of the question. Yeah, when someone runs away from you, sex is out of the question. You complete piece of shit. Keith continues, the curtains were shut and the windows and doors closed. She was trapped. She wriggled away and ran to the door again. I was surprised at how strong she was. I dragged her back to the mattress. I could feel her trembling to my grip. But just when I thought she was totally scared, she kissed me and told me to hurry. Kiss me again, I said with feeling. When she realized that I was giving the orders, she began to put out a little. I, listen to how the dude rationalizes this rape. You know, he's, he's not a rapist. He's just in control. He, he's just the one giving orders. Yeah, she's fucking scared of you, you giant sexual predator. Ah, he goes on. After a while, I yanked down her jeans and rubbed her crotch. I realized under her, uh, I reached under her top and pushed the bra up and over her breasts. We kissed some more. She guided me in. In a few strokes, I came in an orgasm. What, as opposed to a different kind of coming? Fucking moron. I didn't want to stop. I stayed inside and waited. And pretty soon, I was giving it to her again, slow and easy. She finally got tired of waiting for me. She didn't know I'd already come. She yanked at me and started babbling. I don't feel a thing. Why don't you get it over with and take me out to dinner? No more kissing. I'm not in love with you, man. Let's go. I'm hungry. I saw red. It brought back so many nights with other women. Wham, bam, thank you, Keith. A lot of women are users. Sex is a means to an end, not a romantic thing. They'll give you a little, but not because they love you. I pumped in another orgasm. And then I looked down at her with my dick still inside. And I thought, now that it's over, she'll expect payment in full. Well, I'm not giving her a dime. I don't have to put up with that kind of selfish shit anymore. This is her fault. Huh? Interesting. I don't believe for a fucking second that she said, I'm not in love with you, man. Let's go. I'm hungry. This is all just the crazy shit that goes around this fucking just destroyed human being's mind. Oh, he's incredibly made himself the victim in an incident where he's actually raping somebody else. <laughs> he then says, I, I just wish in these kind of things, like the, the counselor could come back after they get taken into prison, put on death row. It's like, and they give this kind of statement. The counselor could just go to the prison guards and be like, listen, uh, the best thing we could do for everybody is just to put them down today. No more waiting. Uh, let's just put them down today. I'll actually pull the trigger myself if it speeds things up. He then says, I looked at her face and I could swear my ex-wife looked back. Oh God. I decided to knock her out with one punch. She would wake up hogtied and nowhere to go. Then I could take all the sex I wanted. I would figure out what to do with her after I'd had my fun. I still wasn't thinking about murder. Well, you kind of were. I put all of my strength into one blow and punched her in the temple. She just stared at me. I hit her again to knock her out, but she stayed awake. I couldn't understand. When I was a boxer, I knocked guys out with one punch. Doubt it. I doubt it. Wearing 12 ounce gloves. Ah, that, I just, I just don't buy any of that. I hit her again and again, but she wouldn't go under. I thought, why isn't this like the crime shows on TV? The more I hit her, the more I wanted to hit her. It felt like me and the cat only better. <laughs> this guy and cats. In my 34 years, I'd never hit a female, but I smashed this girl 20 times. Rights, lefts, jabs, uppercuts, hooks. I punched her till I couldn't recognize her face. Then I punched her some more. It just felt good. I felt like I was paying back the women in my life, the demons in my house, all of my troubles. The ghost would run off, no more noises in the night, waking me up. Paying back the women in his life. I sense some anger towards mama in there as well. No wonder he was joking around at her funeral. He never really says why he hated his mom, but I think he clearly hated her. Also hated his ex-wife, hated the woman he'd left her for, and poor 23-year-old Tanja Bennett becomes the recipient for all this misguided rage. After killing Tondra, Jefferson doesn't panic because he's a psychopath who doesn't possess normal human emotions. Leaving her inside his rented house, he drives back to the B&I Tavern, just sits around, drinks, you know, talks to anyone who will listen to him, establishes an alibi, putting that uh, 102 IQ to, to work. After a few more beers, Jefferson drives back to his house, calmly loads Tondra's body into the front seat of a friend's car. Knowing that he needed to dispose of her body, he drove eastward, past Portland city limits towards the Columbia River Gorge. 
Sticking to the old scenic highway, highway, which was much darker, far less traveled, and consisted of a series of curves and switchbacks, Jesperson found a suitable place near Crown Point, where it was secluded and dark enough to not be seen dumping her body. He pulled the car over, tossed Tanja's body over an embankment, uh, you know, on one of the switchbacks, discarding her corpse as if it was just, you know, uh, taking out the trash. Then he drove to a truck stop near the outer suburb of Troutdale, drank coffee the remainder of the night, establishing another alibi for himself. Hours later, just after dawn, cranked up on caffeine, Jesperson drove to the Sandy River Highway, flung the contents of Tanja's purse, which included her Oregon identification card, as well as the purse itself, into a brushy area near the river. The giant man had just gotten away with his first murder, and he was, and he was a giant, by the way. Tanji had no chance to escape from this violent attack the night before. Uh, Keith was, depending on which source you read, anywhere from 6'6 six, six to 6 foot 8 inches tall, and he weighed anywhere from 240 to 260 pounds. He was a big boy, still is. Serial killer Ed Kemper, uh, if you'll recall, 6'9 and 300 pounds, both still alive. And, and speaking of Kemper, uh, time for another quick word from one of our sponsors. Time, today's Time Suck is brought to you by an upcoming and unprecedented pay-per-view MMA event. A first-ever cage match fought between two serial killers, U.S. federal inmates with no hope of ever getting paroled, but they do get a chance at killing one more time. Sunday, 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 January 5th, 2020, ringing the new year with a cage match fight to the death. Ed Kemper, the literal motherfucker, takes his apples into the ring and goes head to head against Keith, the Canadian cat choker Jesperson. Which giant will fall? Will Jesperson choke Kemper? Will Jesperson's wind pipe be filled with Kemper's micro peen? Buy your ticket and find out. We'll sell you the whole seat, but you'll only need the edge. All proceeds benefit Humane Society, Women's Self-Defense Programs. Don't forget to spay and neuter your pets. And that, of course, is not one of our sponsors. I just kept thinking about uh, how big those dudes are and how entertaining it would be to make them fight uh, to the death in a cage match. And then, you know, we give the proceeds to charity. I, I'll vote for it. Put it on the docket. Put it on the docket. I'll vote for it. Uh, let's get back to the timeline. A week after Keith killed Tanja, a student from Mount Hood Community College was bicycling along the old scenic highway when she spied a woman's chorus line in the brush. The victim had been strangled with the rope, still tied around her neck. Her bra pulled up to expose her breasts, pants bunched down around her, around her ankles. The victim was identified through sketches broadcast in the media as, of course, 23-year-old Tanja Bennett. Uh, the police had no suspects, and for the time being, Keith Jesperson was free to roam. Greatly helping Keith remain free was the strange occurrence of someone else taking credit for this murder. There are a couple accounts of how this false confession went down. We'll give you a bit of an uh, amalgam of those accounts. A woman named Laverne Pavlinak, 57, read the news reports surrounding Tanja Bennett's death and got excited. Laverne was an avid reader of mysteries and true crime books, as well as a devoted fan of the TV series Matlock. This true crime lover was familiar with police procedures, somewhat. As more information became available about Tanja's murder, Laverne took in as much information about the case as she could, and she eventually decided that Tanja's case could serve as the perfect vehicle to end her abusive tenure relationship with her live-in boyfriend, 43-year-old John Sosnowski. Or, Laverne, or, instead of wanting to frame your, uh, you know, boyfriend for murder, you could have gone to a domestic violence shelter. Not saying I know how to get out of physically abusive relationships as a woman, but obviously uh, there has to be a better way <laughs> to get out of it than to try and frame your abuser for a murder they didn't commit. Uh, before Laverne put her terrible plan in motion, she learned that Oregon State Police Detective Alan Corson and Multnomah County Sheriff's Detective John Ingram were conducting the Tonja Bennett murder investigation. She called the detectives, told them that she had important information about the case. Corson and Ingram, both eager to solve the Bennett case, promptly went to Laverne's home to hear what she had to say. But before we go further with what she told them, let's back up a bit. Before Laverne had come to authorities, detectives had scoured the bars and truck stops where Bennett was known to spend much of her time. In one cafe, employees recalled frequent customer John Sosnowski boasting that he had murdered a woman he met in a bar. He was laughing, a waitress told police. He thought it was a big joke. Uh, sounded like a real sharp guy, real fun guy. Uh, a lot of class acts in this suck. Already on probation for drunk driving and driving with a suspended license, John was a notorious drinker whose girlfriend Laverne had a habit of reporting him to the police on phony charges every time they fought. Eight months before the murder, in the spring of 1989, she had telephoned the FBI, falsely accused John of robbing banks. When the G-men cleared him, she repeated the accusation to local police, who also cleared him. Okay, now back to Jesperson's first murder. 
now pulled in for question again. She's found some other, you know, police officers to listen to her. Laverne accuses her husband again of Tanja Bennett's murder. And this time the police obtain a search warrant for the couple's home. Of course, none of Bennett's personal, uh, you know, effects are found. Uh, when Laverne is first questioned by police or was first questioned, she told him that John had merely boasted of the murder. Now, uh, because that didn't work, she ups the ante. She decides to become an eyewitness to help put him behind bars. And she confesses that she watched him rape and kill Tanja on the night of January 23rd. When the detectives come to her house, Laverne tells Corson and Ingram how she had been roughed up at John's hands for years. The detectives listen and Laverne tells them that she had been forced by John to help him rape Tanja. She explained in seemingly intricate detail about the rape, right down to the placement of the rope around Tanja's neck and her subsequent strangulation as she claimed John's hands. She also tells detectives that John had forced her to assist him in disposing of the body and covering up the crime. Corson and Ingram don't know what to make of Laverne's statement. She has a terrible history of false accusations, but eager to close this case, they leave Laverne's home deciding to look further into it. Just because Laverne has, is a proven liar, has a history of false accusations, doesn't mean she's lying this time. They track down John. When they tell him what Laverne had said, of course he denies what Laverne had told him, claims that he was innocent, which he was. Over the next several weeks, Corson and Ingram continued to interview Laverne about the case. Uh, they even take Laverne out to the Columbia River Gorge to see if she could point out specific crime details that only the police and the killer would know. She does pretty well, passes the test uh, with regard to where Tanja's body had been dumped, but she's unable to point out other important things, uh, details like where Tanja's personal belongings were, uh, where her purse and stuff might be located. As the investigation continues with Laverne and John, uh, clearly the prime suspects in this case, Corson and Ingram confer with Multnomah County De Deputy District Attorney Jim McIntyre turn over copies of their case materials to the prosecutor. As a result, Laverne and John eventually are arrested and charged with Tanja's death. Although he had originally claimed he was innocent, John, facing a possible death penalty, decides to plead guilty. Using Laverne's detailed confession, McIntyre is instrumental in getting both Laverne and John sentenced to prison in February 1991, life in prison for John, and a minimum of 10 years for Laverne. And Laverne is like, oh, shit! Oh, man, I did not think this through. Super happy that I've sent John to jail for life. That's That part's awesome. Big fan of that part. Did not realize I would have to serve at least 10 years in prison. Did not realize that I won't get out until I'm damn near 70 years old. So, uh, <laughs> JK, JK, can I be let go now? Sorry about the story. Sorry, it's just another one of my crazy lies. <laughs> uh, no big whoops, right, guys? Come on, let me out. Laverne starts telling everyone that she made up the entire story to end her relationship with John. Unfortunately, no one believes her. Uh, police thought the case was closed, you know, probably. They thought it was probably closed. There were, they were troubled uh, by some recent graffiti that had been found, but not enough to, uh, you know, give her an appeal. In January of 1991, when Laverne is on trial, disturbing message had been found written on a men's room wall at a Greyhound bus depot in Livingston, Montana. It read, I killed Tonja Bennett January 21st, 1990, Portland, Oregon. I beat her to death, raped her and loved it. I'm sick, but I enjoy myself. Two people took the blame, and I'm free. A few days later, in a truck stop men's room in Umatilla, Oregon, a second message is found. I killed Tanja Bennett in Portland. Two people got the blame, so I can kill again. Weird for me to think about these locations. I drove all over the Northwest in my early years of uh, touring as a stand-up comic, doing every show that would have me, working shithole bars and rough little towns all over Montana, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, driving all over the place all hours of the day and night, uh, I've been to truck stops in both of these towns, been to rest areas around those towns, probably used the same bathrooms Keith scribbled his graffiti in, maybe sat in the same stall. Uh, both messages signed with a happy face, a circle with two dots for eyes and a broad crescent smile. Detectives in Portland theorized that some unknown friend of John Sosnovsky had written the graffiti in an effort to spring John from prison. They just couldn't figure out who it was because one of John's friends had written those messages. Keith Jesperson had written those messages. By the time investigators were trying to figure out who had written those messages, Keith had almost killed his second victim. Around 10 p.m. on Thursday, April 12th, 1990, in a shopping center parking lot in Mount Shasta, California, next to the I-5 corridor, Jesperson was approached by an intoxicated woman carrying an infant. Both the woman and child ended up in Jesperson's car where a conversation started. And according to Jesperson, the attack that followed went like this. At the Shasta shopping center, I tried to decide if I wanted to sleep in my car or take a cheap motel room. A nice-looking woman strolled up. A baby sucking on her breast while she sucked a pint of Jack Daniels. She says, what are you looking at? It's only natural. Nope, I don't buy this at all. I do not buy this. This fucking idiot's accounts are terrible of, of what he did. 
Really, dude? A woman with a baby on her teat walked up to you while simultaneously knocking back a pint of JD, drinking while feeding, and saying, what are you looking at? It's only natural. That is some like shitty screenplay kind of writing. Get the fuck out of here. I'm guessing a woman holding a baby approached him, maybe needed some money, and the rest of it is just lies. That's what I think. He says, she took a few steps closer to give me a better look at her tits. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, then we went and sat on a railroad tie. I could see she was half drunk. She told me her name was Jean and her kid was six months old. I told her I was Keith Hunter Jesperson and I was on my way to a temporary job at Copenhagen Utilities in Sacramento. She said she just had a big fight with her husband. Uh, after we talked a little more, she took the last sip from her pint, asked me to walk her to the Jiffy Mart to buy some beer. I carried the 12 pack to my car. We sat in the front seat, griped about our troubles. Then she had me drive her out in the country to look to a lookout place where the locals went. She handed me her baby, dropped her jeans, and peed right next to the open door. I couldn't believe a woman would do that. Mm -hmm. Right, because you're such a classy gentleman. You haven't been hanging around those kind of ladies. So when she got back, I handed her the baby and did the same thing. She was giving me ideas. <laughs> okay. The conversation naturally turned to sex. She claimed to be the best blowjob in Shasta County. She was sexy, all right. Maybe 5'8", 140 to 150 pounds, comfortable figure. When she was talking, I unzipped my pants pulled him, and pulled him out. I played with him in the dark in hopes that she would go down on me. She laid the baby on the back seat and leaned over my lap. I grabbed her by the hair and shoved her face down. That made me even hotter. I was about to orgasm when a whimper came from the back seat and she pulled off. She said, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm married and I don't need this. Drive me home. Just like that. I shoved her back in my cock as hard as I could. A stiff prick has no conscience. When her lips touched him, he shot all over her face. Dude, a stiff prick has no consciousness, no thoughts. You have a conscience. Well, you're supposed to. You have no conscience. You're supposed to have one, you sociopathic rapist. And again, so many classy characters and situations in this suck, right? Getting drunk, getting a blowjob in the front seat while baby is in the back seat. What, what sad world some people choose to live in. Uh, Keith then says, she started screaming at me, so I put her in a headlock and yanked hard. I was trying to break her neck, but I just couldn't get the leverage. It takes a lot of pressure to break a human neck. I tried three times before the baby cried in the back seat and she yelled, don't hurt my baby. I realized that if I killed Jean, I'd have to kill the baby too. What? Why would you have to do that? No, you wouldn't. Uh, I could never kill a kid and I came back to my senses. I stepped out of the car, took some deep breaths and counted to 20. All thoughts of killing went away. Now Jean grabs her baby and heads for town. After she walked 100 yards or so, I drove up and said, come on, get back in. I'll drive you wherever you want to go. It's too cold to walk. It's not good for the baby. <laughs> what the fuck? After she, after she, what? After she got in, I forgot that. that she gets in. After she got in, I said, I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. I dropped her off at the same place I met her. That was my big mistake. I should have killed her. Now, your big mistake was fucking not killing yourself when you were about 18 years old. God. Uh, shortly after this incident, Jesperson was arrested at gunpoint in Corning, California, an old railroad town with 100 miles, uh, about 100 miles north of Sacramento. Uh, it was the personal details he had revealed to Gene that led police straight to him. He was questioned at the scene, then uncuffed, told to go speak to a detective with the Shasta Police Department, which he immediately did. Uh, and by the way, ever since the National Park Mysteries suck, whenever I hear about Shasta or Mount Shasta, I immediately think of Lemurians, those supposed alien creatures living the, you know, in the mountain, the, the new age extremists think, uh, think are there. Keith was interrogated, claimed Gene's neck getting twisted was simply, was simply an accident from the cramped space of the car. Uh, just, just, a, just a blowjob logistics predicament, officers. No big whoops. Gosh dang. It was just hard to get the uh, angles right. You know what I mean? He also led police to uh, evidence that supported his version of events somehow, including showing them empty liquor bottle or an empty liquor bottle in another parking lot that he claimed was Gene's. His version was apparently somehow more believable than Gene's and he was released. Damn it. Despite that, a charge was filed against him for sexual assault. When he failed to appear in court, a felony warrant was issued. He was later arrested in Iowa at a weight check station after they ran his name in the National Crime Information Center database, finding the outstanding warrant from California. Yes, get him. However, Shasta County's warranty, uh, Shasta County's warranty was too weak, so the charge was reduced to a misdemeanor. After that, the cost of extradition just wasn't worth it, and eventually he was exonerated of all charges. Damn it. And then a year and a half after his first murder, Jesperson would kill again. On August 30th, 1992, the body of a woman Keith raped and strangled was found near Blythe, California. Keith said that Jane Do this Jane Doe's name was Claudia when he later wrote about his, her murder. He met her at a truck stop and says she didn't care where Keith was going. She introduced herself as a throwaway girl. I hope that's not true. How sad. 
She told me her name was Claudia, he wrote. She looked clean, but she had no luggage, a bad sign. It meant she could be a female hobo mooching off drivers. She could be a doper looking for a fix. Regardless, she got in the cab, traveled with him for a while. He says he bought her clothes that first day and then invited her to sleep in his sleeper the first night. I leaned over and kissed her, but she didn't kiss back. She said, if you want sex, just ask for it and I'll tell you how much. I said, I don't pay for it, which is not true. He did use me. Uh, I tried to kiss her again and she pressed her lips together. I readjusted her position on the bed and started yanking off her clothes. When she was naked, I stripped and began to grope her body. I had to force her legs apart to enter her and that made the sex even better. I think you mean rape. I think that, I think you mean that, that made the rape even better. Uh, Keith, you're, you're raping again, if you somehow don't know that. Uh, Keith said, I orgasm fast, not wanting this to end too quick. I waited for my hardness to return. I was thinking, this, this bitch is mine. I'll do what I want to her. We had more sex and she pretended to get into it. I knew what she was thinking. If she convinced me we were friends, I wouldn't hurt her. I was on to her act. Mm-hmm. Ah, Keith the victim. He's being manipulated. Oh, man. God, what a bummer, Keith. You just, all these ladies out to fucking trick you. Too bad uh, old Leslie didn't strap you to death when you were a kid. Uh, Keith continues, we stopped at the next truck stop, ate and showered. I wonder why she didn't just take off. But after I bought her some cigarettes, I found out what she was really looking for. According to Jesperson, she was obsessed with getting some crank. And that bothered Keith because he was a clean, upstanding citizen with a no drug policy. Right? He's a super good guy, remember? Keith said Claudia got on his CB radio and asked the whole damn world if anybody had crank. And then she started asking for spending money. And generous, good-hearted Keith gave her $20. And she didn't like that. According to Jesperson, she said to him, give me the money I saw in your wallet or I'll blow the whistle on you. He said, for what? He said, give me the money and I'll walk, or she said, give me the money and I'll walk away. No questions asked. Otherwise, I'll tell that security guard how you assaulted me, uh, which, which he did. Uh, once again, Jesperson paints himself as a victim, uh, you know, in, in a murder he committed. And he also, you know, did rape her. Uh, he says, my mind was going wild with the possibilities. I said, are you crazy? She said, what's it going to be, your money or jail? I reached over and locked the doors. I said, neither one, bitch. I grabbed the roll of duct tape under my pillow, taped her arms in front of her. I taped her ankles together. I looked out over the parking lot, saw it was empty. I pushed my fist into her neck like I did to Tanja, and she went to sleep, just like that. I was trying to decide what to do with her body when she opened her mouth and said, This is bullshit. You can't kill me. I taped her arms to the side vent so she couldn't fall off the bed. I got dressed and told her to shut up. Now that I was heading toward my second murder, I knew I'd be facing the devil someday. And to please him, I had to do a better job of killing. This made this murder more easier morally because God had nothing to do with it. Again, like weird rationalization here, right? Uh, he has to. He has to kill harder now because that's the only way he's going to please the devil. He's going to hell. So he's got to, you know, got to catch the devil's eye. Keith continues, now I can concentrate on killing. I'm raping her in the sleeper again when I hear two cars pull up in the shadow of my truck. Cops. One was a canine unit with a dog. They were using my shade to cool the dog while they went inside and ate. I eased away nice and easy. Got back on I-10. By the time we reached Indio, she, uh, she'd worked herself out of the tape and was trying to get dressed. I hoped I opened the curtain and I see she's already, to, she's ready to pop out and run. She was just waiting for me to stop. He reapplies the constraints he pull, after pulling off into a gravel area. And then he says, at the next truck stop, I screwed her till I couldn't get it up anymore. It was supreme, total gratification. I'm running this show, bitch. He's always talking about running the show. It's fucking power hungry piece of shit, right? noticeably more sadistic this time around. He's embracing his role as rapist, torturer. Uh, yeah, and like all rapists, you know, he craves that power. He says, I started to play a little death game with her, use her as a toy, an amusement. I choked her, let her wake up, choked her again, let her wake up again. That's the kind of game I should have played with Tanja. Each time this woman came to, she made threats. You bastard, I'm not gonna take this shit. I'll turn you into the cops, you son of a bitch. For somebody who was already half dead, she was sure cocky. After I choked her the third time, I waited 10 or 15 minutes till she revived. I said, take a deep breath, count to 10. Now hold your breath. Then I choked her out again. When she woke up, I told her to count to nine, squeeze her neck again. I was playing with her like a cat with a mouse. As the game went on, I told her to count to eight, then seven, six, five. I was breaking her mind. I wanted her to accept that one of these times she wouldn't wake up. Finally, she caught on and just accepted the game. Why, why can't every state quickly enforce the death penalty for subhumans like this. Like, why? How is he How is he allowed in any fucking just world to sit in a cell alive after all this? You know, not smiling, enjoying, you know, probably reflecting on all the shit he did to women and pets, you know, watching TV shows. This dude doesn't deserve to have an ounce of fucking happiness. Keith continues, my adrenaline rushed as I squeezed the breath out of her lungs for the last time. The power in my hands was supernatural. Even though I was wiped out, it gave me another heart on. I needed to get rid of her body, but where? I went into the truck stop restaurant and relaxed with some iced tea. I was surprised how calm I felt. I knew I should feel remorse, but
but I just wished I could start all over again. Just a month later, he would start all over again. Uh, the body of Cynthia, Cynthia Lynn Rose was found in Turlock, California. According to Jesperson, she was a prostitute working uh, the southbound rest area on Highway 99 near Turlock. This would be uh, September 1992. Keith claims he choked Cynthia because she came in his truck while he was sleeping after previously telling her he wasn't interested in having sex. Uh-huh. He's a victim again. He's mind his own business when this vicious, nasty woman demands that she, you know, that he sexually please her. He goes, I reached over and grabbed her and slammed her on the bed. Before she could open her mouth, I started to squeeze her throat. After a while, she went limp and I realized she'd stopped breathing. I killed my third victim and I didn't even know her name. And for what? Nothing. I didn't even get to play the death game with her or have sex. What a waste. What a selfish fuck. Oh, poor Igor. Uh, around, this, around the time of this murder, Keith wrote letters to the media, signed his letters with that smiley happy face. A columnist from the Oregonian quickly dubs him the happy face killer. Although the letters were turned over to police, there was little else for investigators to go on, and Jesperson would maintain his anonymity for a bit longer. Just two months later, Jesperson would murder yet another woman. His fourth victim was another prostitute, Lori Ann Pentland of Salem, Oregon. He wrote that he had used her services before, right? See this filthy liar? He did pay for sex. Her body was found in November of 1992. According to Jesperson, she attempted to double the fee she'd previously charged him for sex, and that pissed him off. How dare she exercise some form of capitalism upon him? How dare she throw a little supply and demand financial lesson his way? According to Jesperson, when he got mad, she threatened to call the police, so he strangled her. Again, he played the death game, choking her, letting her come back, choking her again. Lori's body found behind a store in Salem. Detectives still had no leads for the happy face killer. Keith would later write about this murder saying, even after she closed her eyes and went limp, I kept pushing until I was sure she was dead. Then I stretched her out and cleaned the spot where she'd peed her raincoat. I locked the doors behind me, went into the cafe. I looked under my cup of coffee and I wondered about the mentality of these truck stop hookers. He wondered about their mentality. I wonder if he ever reflected on his own mentality. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think this dude's capable or willing to do a lot of self-reflection. Just over six months later, his next victim's body, the fifth murder, Jane Doe found west of Santanella, California, on a state highway near a truck turnout in July 1993, about 100 miles south of, uh, southeast of San Francisco. Santanella, home of one of two locations of Pea Soup Anderson's. A little restaurant and gift shop, the Queen of the Suck, Lindsay and I stopped at when moving from Los Angeles to Coeur d'Alene. Very cute, very good split pea soup. Wonder if this Jane Doe used to eat there. Wonder if Keith uh, used to eat there as well. The woman had been found dead for only a couple days when her body, or had been dead, excuse me, for only a couple days when her body was found. County coroner listed her death as a drug overdose. Her case would soon be reopened, looked at as a homicide after the happy face killer wrote another letter and referred to her as a street person. More than a year later, September 1994, on the 14th, another Jane Doe is found in Crestview in western Florida, not far from Pensacola. Jesperson claims her name was Suzanne, same M.O., rape, strangulation. Also in 1994, the Portland Oregonian receives another letter in the same awkward hand handwriting, signed with the same smiling face. The author has now claimed a total of six victims. He wrote, I feel bad, but I will not turn myself in. I am not stupid. In a lot of opinions, I should be killed, and I feel I deserve it. Well, we agree there, at least. My responsibility is mine, and God will judge me when I die. I am telling you this because I will be responsible for these crimes and no one else. It all started when I wondered what it would be like to kill someone. And I found out what a nightmare it has been. Oh, it's been a nightmare. Oh, poor Keith. I think it's been a dream come true for you. You were a sick fuck of a kid who loved to brutally torture and kill animals. And now you're a sick fuck of an adult who loves to brutally torture and kill, you know, women. I think this letter is just one more example of him just, you know, he can't take the blame. He wants people to feel sorry for him. You know, he's the victim. He's the one living through the nightmare. Uh, the letter closes on an ominous, or, uh, ominous note saying, Look over your shoulder. I'm closer than you think. Ooh, big, scary Keith. The Arnold Schwarzenegger of his own action movie. Oh, I'd be terrified if I was a cat. At the beginning of the following year, Keith would commit his seventh murder. According to Jesperson, he picked up Angela Surprise near Spokane, Washington. January 1995, agrees to give her a ride to Fort Collins, Colorado to see her father. At one point along the way, they stopped so she can call her dad, who Jesperson would later claim, told her that he didn't want to see her and to stay away. Afterward, Angela changes her mind about going to Fort Collins and asks Jesperson to take her to Indiana instead to visit a friend. In a rage, Jesperson said, I murdered her in Wyoming. He played the death game, 
uh, even as she pleaded and prayed, how dare she ask to be taken to Indiana? How dare she take advantage of Keith's good nature? Jesperson went on to explain that he became enraged when Angela would not let him sleep when they had stopped at a truck stop just east of Cheyenne, Wyoming. She kept, quote, bitching at him to keep driving in bad weather. And he ended up strangling her by placing his fist tightly against her throat as he had done so many times before. Afterwards, he just went back to sleep, clearly not bothered by what he had done. When he woke up, he wondered what he should do with her body. He put her in a plastic garbage bag. And then he'd later say, I wasn't sure what to do with her because she'd been seeing hanging out with me for over a week off and on. And she'd use my credit card to call her dad and boyfriend. She probably had a rap sheet. Her fingerprints might even be on file. I decided that I had to make her disappear completely. I drove to McDonald's and ordered for two. I sat in the truck and talked to her. And by the way, that credit card was actually his brother. This piece of shit even took from his fucking brother. Uh, I drove to McDonald's and ordered for two. I sat in the truck and talked to her. If you had just played straight with me, bitch, you would be eating right now, I I thought and laughed. I didn't feel remorseful at all. To me, she was just another bitchy woman, better off dead. Oh, man, she she chose to rile up the powerful Keith. How dare she upset this great testament to manhood? Didn't she know she was dealing with a very important person? And then what he chose to do next is pretty fucking heinous even by his standards. Speaks to how much hatred he had towards these women, how, how little their lives meant to him. He said, yeah, this is rough. With the truck dark, I laid her stiff body on the pavement. I tied a length of black nylon rope to cross to a cross member under my trailer just long enough to allow her body to drag between the dual rear wheels so she wouldn't be seen from passing vehicles. I connected the rope to her ankles, placed her nose down under the trailer. That way I could drag her backward and grind off her face and prints. I did all this in about three minutes. A few clusters of traffic passed me but didn't slow down. I ended up dragging her 12 miles before I slowed down to check what was left. One shoulder was gone, a thigh gone, her chest was broken, guts gone, arm and hands gone to the shoulders. I figured that other drivers would see her body parts in their headlights and think they were roadkill. Then he tries to make a joke, this fucking piece of shit. A two-legged deer. Her face was ground off to the ears, no dental work to worry about. I dragged what was left down the bank and dumped her in 12-inch grass about 50 feet from the freeway and then 10 feet inside the fence. Man, like most serial killers, he just did whatever would keep him from being caught, no matter how fucked up it was. He... Two months after murdering Angela, Jesperson decides that a woman he'd been dating off and on for a while, Julie Ann Winningham, was only interested in him for his money. She's just taking advantage of him. Just another nasty woman. And she needed to die as well. This would be his eighth victim. According to him, he really liked Winningham, but still on March 10th, 1995 in Washougal, Washington, located just across the Columbia River from Troutdale, that Portland suburb I mentioned earlier, uh, he strangles her. And her murder would be his downfall. She was the first and only victim he had a personal link to. On the night of her death, as Jesperson raped her, he told her about his many murders. He said, I told her how I'd dragged a woman under my trailer till a thousand pieces flew off. When she heard that, she went limp. She laid there quiet and docile, waiting for the end. I played the death game three or four more times. I thought about saving her for the next night, but I didn't want to push my luck. She could put me in prison. And she would. Thank God. Uh, Keith tossed her nude body down a scenic bank off of Columbia, off the Columbia Gorge Highway. And a few days later, investigators found her remains. Season Clark County Washington Sheriff's Department Detective Rick Buckner, known for his role in the Wesley Allen Dodd child murders investigation a few years prior, received the Julie Ann Winningham case assignment. Buckner initially learns that Winningham was a Camas resident who had relocated to Utah for a while after breaking up with her truck driver husband. According to those he interviewed, she returned to Camas in February 1995 with a man named Keith Jesperson, who she referred to uh, as her fiance. Didn't take long for Buckner to track down, you know, where Keith worked. He worked uh, for a Cheney, Washington-based trucking company still. By Wednesday, March 22nd, 1995, Buckner had traced Jesperson to Las Cruces, New Mexico, a city located near the Mexican border. And with the help of sheriff's deputies in Las Cruces, uh, Buckner and another detective named, uh, detained Keith, excuse me, for more than six hours and questioned him about the murder of Julie Winningham. And by Jesperson's own account, Buckner and the other detective tried to get him to confess to Winningham's murder. He wouldn't talk. Lacking enough concrete evidence, minus a confession at the moment to arrest him, the detectives had no choice but to release him. But he was still obviously the prime suspect. Afterward, Jesperson immediately heads for Arizona. Buckner returns to Washington. Shortly after being interrogated and released while traveling through southern Arizona, Jesperson attempts to kill himself. I think kind of. I don't think he tried that hard. First, he tried in the evening of March 22nd. Then again, on the next night, each time he tried to overdose on some over-the-counter sleeping pills. Each time he said his body rejected the pills. To me, this is just another like plea for sympathy for him. Uh, he was worried that he'd soon be caught. He didn't want to accept the consequences. March 21st, or excuse me, March 24th, 1995, after deciding that the cops were going to nail him for Julie Winningham's murder. 
and that he might be able to avoid the death penalty if he just turned himself in, Jesperson wrote two letters, one to his kids, one to his brother. The letter to his brother in part read, seems like my luck has run out. I will never be able to enjoy life on the outside again. I got into a bad situation and got caught up with emotion. Yeah, it's not his fault, you guys. He, he kind of, he stumbled, really, into a bad situation. Could, could happen to any of us. You know, uh, he, as one does, he got caught up in too much emotion. He's a great dude, just, ah, just fucking circumstances, you know? He continues with, I killed a woman in my truck during an argument. With all the evidence against me, it looks like I truly am a black sheep. The court will appoint me a lawyer. There will be a trial. I am sure they will kill me for this. I am sorry that I turned out this way. I have been a killer for five years and have killed eight people, assaulted more. I guess I haven't learned anything. Dad was always worried about me because of what I've gone through in the divorce, finances, etc. What he's what he's gone through? Oh man, his mean wife put him through the ringer because he was just doing. He all he was doing was fucking a lot of other women on the road. You know, gosh, dang. If only he hadn't been born a black sheep. Why? Why did God curse him so? Please, God, take care of Keith. Oh, he's such a good guy. Uh, Keith continues with, I've been taking it out on different people. As I saw it, I was hoping they would catch me. I took 48 sleeping pills last night and I woke up well rested. Right? Because he's Arnold Schwarzenegger. You can't put the Terminator down with some, you know, sleeping pills. The night before, I took two bottles of pills to no avail. He's just too tough. And then he says, they will arrest me today. Oh, Keith, if you really wanted to have been caught and stopped, you could have turned yourself in after the first murder. Right, this letter, you know, reads to me as, again, just, you know, another pathetic attempt to uh, to garner some sympathy, trying to avoid the death penalty. Uh, later that same night, after dropping letters uh, he'd written off in the mail, Jesperson calls Detective Buckner and confesses to the murder of Julie Ann Winningham. Six days later, March 30th, Rick Buckner flies to Arizona to take Jesperson into custody, return him to Washington State, where he would be formally charged with Winningham's murder. When he arrives in Washington, Jesperson calls his brother, instructs him to destroy the letter that he had sent. Guess he thought maybe it wouldn't help him after all. Maybe he shouldn't have written the thing about killing the other women. However, on the advice of a lawyer and Jesperson's father, his brother decides to turn the letter over to police, and it was quickly published by a number of newspapers. After arresting Jesperson based on Keith referencing seven other homicides, Detective Buckner begins transmitting information about Jesperson to various law enforcement agencies around the country to see if he matches up for other crimes. Buckner provided information about Jesperson's confession and the letter that he'd written to his brother, inquired whether there were any jurisdictions that had unsolved homicides that might fit into Jesperson's travel itineraries. Within days, Buckner's office received 16 responses from law enforcement agencies as far away as New York and Florida and the process of examining unsolved homicides in relation to Keith in a number of states had begun. Focusing on female homicide victims found along major roadways, and near truck stops, authorities in Oregon, Nevada, and Utah were among the first to begin re-examining some cases. While Jesperson sat in the Clark County, Oregon jail for the murder of Julie Winningham, Clark County being located just across the Columbia River from Portland, Oregon, he began talking to his attorney, Thomas Phelan, about other crimes he'd committed. The conversation began when Phelan asked Jesperson about the letter to his brother. Jesperson began telling his innermost secrets to his attorney and then realized he would be labeled a serial killer after the police linked him to additional killings. Against his attorney's legal advice to keep his mouth shut about all this, Jesperson started talking about these other murders to inmates in prison. He loved the attention from these stories. And then one of the inmates reported what he had said to authorities. And after being interrogated again, Keith identified Angela, that woman he'd killed and then dragged her remains under his truck in Wyoming two months before killing his girlfriend as another one of his victims. He told the investigators about a significant detail that left little doubt in their minds that he was, for reasons known only to him, being truthful with them regarding Angela. He said she had a tattoo of the cartoon character Tweety Bird on one of her ankles in which Tweety was making an obscene gesture with one of its hands. Clark County investigators relayed the info to their counterparts in Wyoming and Nebraska. Then in September of 95, based on specific and accurate information from Jesperson, uh, you know, relayed to these uh, investigators in Nebraska. A Nebraska highway patrolman found Angela remains, or, or, or I'm sorry, found Angela's remains lying near the shoulder of Interstate 80 near Gothenburg, small town of 3,200 residents located near the South Platte River, where it had been, where the remains had been lying in tall grass for several months. Badly decomposed, most of her skin decayed. Investigators were able to identify her only after examining pelvic x-rays and finding the tattoo of Tweety Bird. Wyoming investigators now really began to build their case against Jesperson for this murder, since based on Keith's confession, while her body had been dumped in Nebraska, her murder had occurred in Wyoming. They hoped this conviction would bring Keith the death penalty. Jesperson was charged with Angela's murder. Wyoming prosecutors promptly rejected an offer by his attorney for him to provide more info about her death in exchange for an agreement 
from Wyoming not to seek the death penalty. Meanwhile, investigators in Washington, California, and Oregon are working to, uh, uh, on examining his handwriting to help link him to other murders. Because of the comments he'd been making to other inmates and due to the letter he'd written to his brother, the investigators wanted to figure out if Jesperson was the same person who had written letters to the Oregonian, claiming to have killed three women in California and two in Oregon. The investigators saw similarities, not only in the handwriting, but in the details of the crimes themselves. Regarding one of the California victims, the happy face killer wrote that he had used duct tape to bind her hands and feet, a fact that was never released to the public. Investigators indeed found duct tape near her body. Uh, similarly, in statements he made to the police, Jesperson claimed to have duct taped Julie Winningham's mouth shut. Uh, that detail was not released to the public. Investigators also were examining a happy face killer letter sent to the Columbian uh, newspaper in Vancouver, Washington, just north of Portland, across the river. Uh, that had been sent while Keith had been incarcerated. He had smuggled this letter out of jail. In that letter, Keith again alluded to a desire to be caught so that he would not kill again and stated, I know what I've done has been wrong and I feel sorry for all the victims. Or the, or, I'm sorry, and I feel sorry for all the families of my victims. I am in fact the happy face killer. I created that man because I wanted to be stopped, but it is hard just to come out and say it. I have prayed many nights in this cold, dark prison cell for the answer and God has told me to come clear with it all. Tell the truth about everything. All right, he's talking to God now. I will not be happy until I am replacing that man, John Sosnowski, in the Oregon State Penitentiary for the crime I did, and he goes free. Most people will say that I am a monster. I am not a monster. Just like the movie Jurassic Park, I was created by people. Ha! Ah, uh, he's the one really hurt, you guys. Oh, man, he didn't choose to become a killer. We made him, me and you. We created this monster. Jesperson comments about John Sosnowski and, and their obvious relevance to the Tonja Bennett case shocked investigators. And why was Keith doing this? Was it because he was just a really good dude and he just felt bad about the wrong people being in prison for his murder? No, of course not. His motive was 100% selfish. He's a sociopath. He, he didn't care about uh, them. He just knew that if he was extradited to Wyoming, he would face a potential death penalty for the murder of Angela Surprise. However, if he was able to confess to Tonja Bennett's murder and be sentenced to death in Oregon, the state where a death sentence has not been carried out since early 60s, he knew that he could at the very least postpone legal actions in Wyoming. He knew that it was likely Oregon would give him life in prison, you know, if he just successfully worked out a plea agreement in this case. According to Jesperson, at first the police didn't believe him, but then he led them to the location of Tonja's purse and her Oregon identification card, something that Laverne Pavlinak had not been able to do, if you recall. They couldn't deny now that it appeared very likely that they had put the wrong people behind bars. Jesperson also indicated that he was willing to plead no contest to the murder of Tonja Bennett to spare investigators a new murder trial, to spare them the cost if they released Laverne and John, who now had served you know, more than four years in prison for a crime they did not commit. Uh, a, a crime Laverne, in my opinion, should now get in even more trouble for. Right? I hate it when that false accusation thing people do. You should get in so much fucking trouble for that. Right? Like, like he should get released, John should, and, and she should have to serve a life sentence, in my opinion, for happily getting somebody else falsely convicted for a life sentence. If I was given the chance to vote on a new law that gave way harsher sentences to people who knowingly falsely indict others, oh man, I would do it in a second. In the meantime, while Jesperson waited to enter his plea for murdering Tonja Bennett and as the state of Wyoming continued building its case against him for the murder of Angela Surprise, Jesperson continued to claim responsibility for additional murders. All in all, he said he was responsible for at least 160 slains across the U.S., Jesperson told the media that he was admitting to all these murders because he was bothered by his guilty conscience, which he doesn't have. However, like Henry Lee Lucas before him, Jesperson would later recant most of these confessions. And like Henry Lee Lucas, the real reason Keith did this because he loved the attention he was getting. And then when he confessed, he got extra perks. He got better food, less time in his cell. People were hanging on his every word. He loved the attention so much that eventually this dude would be banned from giving interviews uh, to the press outside of occasional over-the-phone interviews. You can't do face-to-face -face interviews with this guy because he gets uh, too fucking giddy and happy. And I love that they uh, you know, have stopped allowing him to give those because it makes him happy. The more crimes Keith confessed to, the crazier his confessions got. <laughs> this fucking idiot. At one point, Jesperson told investigators that he was responsible for many of the murders assigned to the Green River Killer Task Force. It would be several years before Gary Ridgway would be apprehended for these murders that took place primarily in the southwest area of Washington around the Green River. Since many of Jesperson's victims were known prostitutes and strangulation was his preferred method of murder, Jesperson naturally looked like a feasible candidate in at least some of these killings. Keith told investigators that he'd ran into the Green River Killer by the side of the road after they had each committed unrelated murders and were disposing of their bodies. He actually said with a straight face that they laughed about it and then got some coffee afterwards. 
To make this story even more absurd, he said that the Green River Killer looked over some of the jewelry that Keith had taken off of a woman he had killed. And then Gary said, we both have, we both have killed identical twins. Yours is a sister to mine. What the fuck? He's such an idiot. Like one serial killer would be disposing of a body, then run into another serial killer doing the same thing. And then the two of them would just, you know, yuck it up. Go grab some coffee. Right? Hey, buddy, put your hands up. You're under arrest for murder. Putting you away forever, dirtbag. <laughs> ah, JK, I'm just joshing you. Oh, my heck, you should see your flipping face right now. Surfing scared, bud. Now, it looks like you're a serial killer, huh? Ah, uh, yeah, me too, me too. Nice disposal site, right? I'm just, I'm just down the ridge. Uh, great minds think alike, isn't that what they say? <laughs> uh, the only other person you're going to run into way out here is another serial killer like me. Too funny. You know, just last week, I ran into some dude named uh, Robert uh, Lee Yates. I was done with some bodies outside of Spokane after killing some nasty lady who was trying, trying to take advantage of my good nature. After, after raping her, uh, you know, uh, and I was, I was, you know, just trying to be an awesome dad and hang out with my three kids, you know, in Spokane after that, because I'm, I'm pretty amazing. Anyway, you want to grab some coffee and some pancakes, swap some stories? I mean, you seem like a good, smart, handsome dude who I'm guessing gets the short end of the stick all the time when it comes to nasty, manipulative women. Just like me, we're just two victims out here, just burying the bodies of the women we killed and raped. <sighs> investigators knew Keith was full of shit 99% of the time, but they listened to this nonsense because the other 1% of the time he would actually help solve crimes. In October 1995, just before his trial was slated to begin, Keith Jesperson pled guilty to the murder of Julie Ann Winningham before Clark County, Washington Superior Court Judge Robert L. Bobbert Harris. And Judge Bobbert sentenced him to life in prison. On Thursday, November 2nd, 1995, Jesperson entered a no-contest plea before Multnomah County presiding Judge Donald Ronald McDonald, uh, no, Donald H. Launder for the murder of Tonja Bennett. Launder immediately sends Jesperson to life in prison again, setting a minimum 30-year prison term before being eligible for parole. Launder's sentence, in effect, gave Jesperson what he wanted, life in prison to be served in Oregon State, no death penalty. Then there was another Oregon case involving Jesperson, the murder of 23-year-old Lori Ann Pentland. According to the Marion County District Attorney's Office, investigators linked Jesperson to Pentland's murder through DNA, other forensic evidence, after learning he was the happy face killer. He was again sentenced to life in prison in Oregon with a 30-year minimum term before parole eligibility. Following his sentence in Washington, he was transferred to Oregon State Penitentiary to begin serving the consecutive sentences there. If he somehow were to live and complete his sentences in Oregon, he would be transferred to Washington State to begin serving another life sentence there. Then on November 27, 1995, Laverne Palinak, John Savnoski, released from prison. Meanwhile, authorities in Wyoming continue to pursue a possible death penalty conviction for Jesperson. More than two years later, after considerable legal wrangling, the state of Wyoming finally succeeds in extraditing Jesper Jesperson for trial for the murder of Angela Sabrise. For the next few months, for the next few months, uh, as prosecutors prepare to go to trial, Jesperson taunts authorities, threatens to force a costly trial by changing his story regarding the jurisdiction in which the, uh, the crime had occurred. He kept flip-flopping, sometimes saying he killed her in Wyoming, sometimes saying he thought he would killed her in Nebraska. After going back and forth with Jesperson's deliberately misleading statements, a deal is worked out. Jesperson agrees to plead guilty to murdering Angela Surprise in Wyoming if and only if Laramie County prosecutors agree to not seek the death penalty. Keith continues to think of Keith and only Keith and not take responsibility for what he's done. To further illustrate the lack of remorse this dude was still showing after all this, in another letter to the press, Keith tries to be funny again. And he writes about offering a self-starter serial killer kit. He writes, this is the offer you have all been dying for, the self-start serial killer kit. Now you can be the only serial killer on your block. Learn from a professional serial killer. Get rid of that unwanted family member. Get that job you always wanted by opening up the slot. Everyone will be dying to meet you. You get a full life, uh, you get a full life, I think it meant to write life-sized. You get a full life-size Julie Winningham look-alike doll with an extra tough spring back neck. So you will soon have the strength to squeeze the shit out of anyone. Fuck! Holy tone deaf. Dude! Dude, not funny when you really raped and killed her. No conscience. He's so dark. Uh, after over a decade, or over a decade after going to prison in November of 2008, Jesperson's eldest daughter, Melissa G. Moore, appears on the Dr. Phil show to talk about her dad. Moore wrote a book called Shattered Silence, the untold story of a serial killer's daughter. I bought the Kindle version, used it as one of the sources for today's tale. Uh, Melissa Moore talks about how she lived with her father until her parents divorced. Uh, she said she began to notice that her dad was different when she was in elementary school. Their house bordered an apple orchard, and her dad killed various stray cats and gophers that wandered nearby. 
That one day she watched horrified as he hanged her pet kittens from the family's clothesline and beat them to death. Uh, yeah, I would say that is definitely a sign that your dad is not quite like other dads. Hey, Cindy, do you hate it when your dad takes kittens and hangs them on a clothesline and beats them to death? What? Your dad's never done that? What about you, Susie? Never? Huh, weird. Maybe you guys are right. Maybe my dad is a bit different. Uh, September of 2009, Keith is indicted for the murder of that Jane Doe, he called Claudia, whose body was found in the desert near Blythe, California, 92. He's extradited to Riverside County, California, to face those charges that December. Uh, her remains have never been identified. In January of 2010, he received another life sentence for the murder of this Jane Doe. On March 1st, 2014, Lifetime airs the Lifetime original movie, The Happy Face Killer, starring David Arquette as Keith Jesperson. And I haven't seen it because I watched the trailer and it looks fucking horrible. Looks really terrible. Uh, today, Keith, David Arquette, I don't know how he got cast. He does not, I just can't, I just can't see him as a scary serial killer. Today, Keith continues to be in prison at the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem, Oregon, where from what I can gather, the now 64-year-old man continues to be the same creep he's always been. A dude who continues to play the victim, uh, shows no remorse, enjoys talking about the details of his, of his crime. In 2015, investigative journalist Juju Cheng, no relation to Pootie, put it in your lunchbox, Shirley. Uh, interviewed Keith over the phone for a piece on Keith and his daughter, Melissa, for 2020. And at one point, she, he calmly talks to Juju about how he dragged Angela Surprise, the woman he picked up in Spokane, uh, under his truck in 1995, somewhere in Wyoming. And Juju, horrified, says, it is so gruesome what you're describing. I mean, there's a possibility that these people's family members might be listening to you describing this. And he says in a slightly irritated tone, I'm sorry it happened. I wish it never happened. Can we move on? Can we just move on? Yeah, I get it, you guys. God, I killed at least eight women. I'm a terrible dude. Yada, yada, yada. I've said it like a hundred times. I'm sorry. Why can't we move on? I said, JK, I realize now that things got out of hand. Why do I, why do I always get the short end of the stick? Why is everyone always out to get me? Why do those women have to make me do what I did? Ugh. And that is all for today's Time Suck Timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. So that's the story of this sick fuck's life. He hated his family. He hated women. He super hated cats. He saw himself as the victim in everything he did, even in the murders and rapes he committed. Was his dad too hard on him? Yeah, it sounds like he got carried away with a strap too many times. Definitely uh, way too into killing cats. Not, not a good dad move to push your son to, to kill little critters. Uh, like around the neighborhood. Is it his dad's fault he became a serial killer? I don't think so. I think it's no one's but Keith's fault. Uh, was he, like we talked about at the beginning of the suck, genetically predestined to become a serial killer? No, I don't think he was. You know, he knew what he was doing. Yeah, he knew it was wrong. He tried to hide the evidence of what he did. He didn't kill anyone until after he was divorced, long after the cat murders of his youth. If we can trust his story, he says he never laid a hand on a woman until he was 34. If he just had to kill because of his genes, he would have killed long before. Uh, taking things further, I think most of our lives are largely defined by the consequences of our choices. Some of us are born with much more uh, money than others, much more athletic ability, much better health, more intellectual ability, et cetera. But I think most human beings, excluding those born into like third world poverty or some extreme situation are, are born with enough ability and enough freedom of choice to be able to consistently make good choices or make consistently bad choices. And either lead a, a positive, largely comfortable and rewarding life and help the world become a better place. Or, you know, you can make consistently terrible choices and struggle and, and, and live in mostly pain and confusion and help bring those uh, down around you and just add to the world's misery. What kind of life are you choosing to lead, right? I referenced Keith's loser mentality earlier, blaming everyone else for shortcomings. I hope you don't have that. You know, it, it won't help you meet Zach. I know life can be hard. Some of us have it so much easier than others, but no matter how hard your life is, I really don't think going to the mental place of thinking everyone is out to get you or that you have it harder than everyone else and you just can't catch a break is going to ever help your life improve. I think it will for sure make your life worse. Uh, now, before moving on to Time Sucker updates, let's look back at the wasted loser of a life of Keith Hunter Jesperson, the happy face killer in today's top five takeaways. Time Suck Top Five Takeaways. Number one, Keith strangled at least eight women to death. Six of them died after playing what he called the death game. And he still didn't get the death penalty. He's hanging out somewhere right now. 
Number two, how many cats did this son of a bitch kill? Jesus, I'm, and brutally, and I'm not opposed to killing animals, right? I would have loved to have gotten a deer uh, this year, but I don't want them to suffer. And I'm okay with killing like deer because I, I eat meat and I would feel like a huge hypocrite being okay with eating a burger or some bacon, but not being okay with hunting. But getting off on animal suffering, killing creatures, not for food, but for the pleasure it gives you to take life. If killing any kind of animal, an animal that's not tormenting you or causing you harm, fills you with joy, you might want to have your head examined. Also, if you're that person, Bo Jangles just told me to tell you to go fuck yourself. Number three, this psycho, despite being a terrible, terrible person, did do something a lot of well-intentioned lawyers have been able to do. He got two people out of jail. Uh, Laverne Pavlinak and her boyfriend, John Sosnovsky, served four years for a murder he committed. Then he got them free. Uh, he did so so he could avoid being extradited to Wyoming. That's what he was hoping would happen, where he was worried they would have him killed. Uh, but still, you know, he, he did do, I guess, one kind of good thing, uh, accidentally in a way. Number four, the Canadian cat choker raped and killed a woman, then strapped her to the bottom of his long haul truck and dragged her remains along the pavement for 12 miles. I think that detail might stick with me for quite a while. That's, that's a new one. Number five, new info. I don't want Keith Jesperson's tale to give you the wrong idea about the trucking industry. It's not all truck stop prostitution and serial killing. Without truckers, our lives would look very different and not in a good way. Here's a few kick-ass things you should know about the trucking industry. Trucking makes up the largest portion of the American transportation industry, about 27%. Truckers moved roughly 10.8 billion tons of freight in 2017 alone. Last year, we have the best records for. That equates to 30 pounds a year for every man, woman, and child in the U.S. Data shows that trucking is nearly 6% of all full-time jobs in the U.S. That's 7.4 million jobs. Experts say most grocery stores would run out of food in just three days if long-haul truckers stopped driving. Enjoying that nacho cheese Dorito? Or that maybe that organic Greek yogurt? Perhaps some dragon fruit? Maybe some cheese? Anything else you didn't grow in your yard or buy from your local farmer's market? Well, thank a trucker. And also, in order to grow the shit in your yard or to, or to buy that stuff that was grown in the farmer's market, I, I'm betting that stuff was also, you know, uh, dependent on some, some type of goods provided by trucking. Uh, to go with employing millions of drivers, the industry as a whole generates around $700 billion in annual revenue. Were the industry itself a nation, it would have ranked 33rd in the worldwide GDP rankings in 2017. Finally, the average professional long-haul trucker logs more than 100,000 miles per year, two to, two to 3,000 miles per week to make all that happen. So when you're thinking about how much your commute sucks, shut the fuck up. Think about a trucker, right? Maybe may make you feel good. So there you go. Trucking makes our economy go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just because a happy face killer and some other weirdos have killed a few folk and chose the trucking industry to hide that in, that doesn't mean you should look at the next beard boasting keg bellied truck driver as a probable murder suspect. Time suck. Top five takeaways. We did it. Another true crime chapter has been added to the gargantuan book of the suck. Glad the happy face killer is stuck behind bars. Not happy he's alive. Doesn't seem fair to me after everything that dude admitted to doing that he's, uh, he's still breathing. Uh, thanks to the Time Suck team. Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins. High Priest of the Suck, Harmony Camp, Reverend Dr. Joe, Horsecock Paisley. The producer, formerly known as Micropene. Uh, thanks to the Bit Elixir app design crew. Thanks to Steph Coxcurvy for stopping by. Uh, thanks also to Kate and Logan at Spicy Club, formerly known as Axis Apparel. Big thanks to the script keeper, Zach Flannery. So much good research in this one. A uh, link to both a private Facebook group and Discord group in the episode description if you want to meet, converse with more time suckers. Uh, next week, our little true crime run continues with David Berkowitz, the infamous and batshit crazy son of Sam. On August 10th, 1977, 24-year-old postal employee David Berkowitz was arrested and charged with being the son of Sam, a serial killer who terrorized New York City for more than a year, killing six people, wounding seven others with a 44 caliber revolver. Because Berkowitz generally targeted attractive young women with long brown hair, hundreds of young women had their hair cut short and dyed blonde. During the time he terrorized the city, this dude dramatically affected uh, hairdresser business in the city. Uh, after his arrest, Berkowitz claimed the demons and a black Labrador retriever owned by a neighbor named Sam had ordered him to commit the killings. Uh, he was even worse at taking responsibility for his crimes than Keith Igor Jesperson. So join us for the sure to be entertaining Son of Sam Suck this next Monday. And stay with me right now as we head into today's Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker Updates. Today's first update comes from an awesome veteran meat sack sharing some love for Simo Haiha. 
also for the military, Austin Clare writes, thanks from a veteran space lizard. All hail the suck master, the knowledge nuker. Oh, that makes me want to push that button. The smoothie guy slayer, he whispered to me. Greetings, sir, from a loyal space lizard and veteran of the most badass shit-kicking army in the world. Kill them all and let Lucifina sort them out. I wanted to thank you for your continued support for the men and women who have served and continue to serve this country. You made my wife's and my Veterans Day. She is a badass Air Force vet named Lindsay. Good name. Uh, even better with your awesome suck on the SEMO the, com- on SEMO, the commie killer. As soon as I heard you were making a SEMO suck, I couldn't wait to hear it. I served a tour each in Iraq and Afghanistan, and for a brief time in my infantry career, I was also a sniper. The reason I was so stoked about this week's suck is that part of my required reading assigned by my sniper team leader was a book about, you guessed it, SEMO. Aside from the technological advances since uh, he lived, the the field craft of the sniper has changed little over the last century, prompting many modern snipers to study the silent killers of the past. The true purpose of this email, O sucker of subjects, is to formally invite you to support this veteran and his band, Smith Avenue, at our second ever live performance here in beautiful Seattle. Would I shit my pants if you came to see us play? Yes. Yes, I would. Do I expect you to have time in your busy as hell schedule to attend? No. I know you're all over the place with the good work that you do. However, oh, sniper of the suck, spotter of the truth, if you could find room in an update section to send a shout out to Smith Avenue, playing 9 p.m. one Friday a month at the A1 Hop Shop at 144th and Greenwood Avenue, you would make me oh so happy. I would cry tears of 308 shell casings all over the floor of my Black Hawk. Our next two shows are November 29th and January 3rd, attached to a pic of me in Afghanistan taken by an army combat photographer, so you know I'm not full of shit, and the flyer for our next show, designed by me, motherfucker! Thank you for taking the time to read my email, Suck Master. Apologize for the length. Nah. Your loyal space sister and soldier of the suck, Suck Sergeant Austin Clare. Well, thank you, Austin. Appreciate what you and your wife have done for our country. Uh, The rooftop scan pig is badass. You look pretty fucking impressive there. You look like more like Schwarzenegger than this fucking jackass I talked about today. Uh, holy shit. Uh, I won't be able to make it, uh, but any Seattle area suckers looking for something to do, the next show, Friday, November 29th, head to the A1 Hop Shop in Seattle. Show starts at 8. And also thanks to all the military suckers who have given me some challenge coins over the past few years. Man, my dad swung through the suck dungeon and he teared up a bit. Looking at all the gifts from the military and law enforcement and first responders, he said, quote, that's cool as hell, Danny. That's cool as hell. It is cool as hell, Dad, and I'm honored to have received the support of so many uh, of, uh, you know, meat sacks, all of whom are braver than I. Next update is from a kick-ass college sucker, Julia Cox. Julia writes, hello, Dan, he who sucks on high. You might remember my dad and my sister. They were at your Denver stand-up and live suck shows in early November. I live in California for college, and my sister was kind enough to FaceTime me in so that I could talk to you and Lindsay. I recently started my first year of college and moved from Colorado to Northern California, where I don't know anybody and I've never lived before. I've struggled during these first few weeks with feeling lonely, but I've been sucking almost every day and it's been helping me so much. You never fail to make me laugh and my sister and I have an excuse to talk about something until we can see each other again. I bet you'll have some stuff to talk about with this fucking creep today. Uh, Thanks for making my transition just a little bit easier. Hail Nimrod. Praise be to Lucifina. Give Bo Jangle some Scooby Snacks for me. Well, hello, Julia. You know, I talked to Lindsay and neither one of us have any memory of ever talking to you or meeting your dad or sister. Uh, Lindsay thinks you're lying about the whole thing, which I think is a bit unfair but probably accurate. So please don't send emails like that anymore. JK! Gosh dang, oh my heck. Of course I remember you, Julia, and I remember your dad and sister. I thought it was awesome that they FaceTimed you in for a pic. Uh, Sorry the college transition has been rough. Glad time suck can help. Uh, Give it some time at this school, you know? If if you still hate it, like a month after getting back from Christmas break, then maybe look into transferring. No point in staying somewhere that makes you miserable. A lot of other schools out there. However, until then, Make sure you give it a real go. Give it your best effort, you know, to, to, to blend in, join a club or two, uh, put yourself in some places to meet some like-minded folk, maybe post in the Facebook group, see if there's any suckers over there in the area. I hope you find your tribe, finish your freshman year strong. Uh, hail Nimrod, Julia. Hail Lucifina. Lucifina says it is college. Don't forget to have some reckless fun. But the dad in me says fucking cool it, Lucifina. Be careful, goddammit. There's some creeps out there. Now Lucifina has me worried about you. Next up, amazing mother sucker and now grandmother sucker, Jesse G, writing in, I have news. I doubt that you will remember me, but two minutes of your time meant everything. My son, happy cried on his 21st birthday. I'm Jesse G. His name is Blake. You called me a kick-ass mom. I couldn't stop hitting replay. Uh, As you spoke to my son, whom you don't know or owe a thing, you kindly took the time to read a letter from me. You told him to light up the world like some Greek motherfucking fire. You left us both inspired. And son of a bitch, he paid attention. Excelled at work. He's getting mad recognition. 
He also fell for a beautiful girl. And guess what, y'all? She is pregnant. I'm going to be a grandma. I'm so excited. I can't stand it. Just wanted to share this with the entire Suck Dungeon. May 22nd, new space lizard landing. Love y'all. Jesse G. E, so happy. Yay, I'll be a grandma. <laughs> so many, so many exclamation points and capital letters in that message. I fucking love it, Jesse G. I'm so happy for you and your family. Hail Nimrod. I love picturing the sheer joy you felt writing that message. I love hearing about so much good, especially after putting my head in the so much bad space of learning about the happy face killer. There's a lot of good people in the world. They're not all like him, thank God. Second to last update coming in from fantastic sucker Jared Libby. Jared wrote this message with the subject line of, please read this spoiler. You may cry a bit, so you've been warned. Uh, Jared writes, and yes, oh man, had some tears over this uh, the other night. Uh, Jared writes, hi, uh, Dan, the one with too many nicknames I can't remember. I'm writing you because I would like to share this with you. Last year, one of my close friends from the military, when I was stationed in Washington with him, lost his child, Aiden, who was four at the time, but would now be five to sudden unexplained death in childhood, S-U-D-C. One night when they were putting him down for bed after his bath, he had passed away in the night and his parents woke to the worst thing I could imagine any parent would find. They're usually full of life, energetic little boy who was more curious about this world than anyone could ever be and one of the most caring little boys who would go out of his way in generosity and compassion to make you feel better if you were upset or anything else. Once my wife and I heard this news, we had our child who is four now sleep with us the next few months. To top all that off, after we celebrated Aiden's life, his father was threatened to be kicked out of the military all because a coroner failed to fill out his paperwork correctly. The coroner said that both the parents were weed users when actually only Aiden's mother, uh, Aiden's mother uses it and even then very seldomly to help her fall asleep and never around her children and only when her husband is home. It has been a year since we had gotten that horrific news that dropped my wife and I to our knees, not knowing how to tell our three-year-old at the time. Sorry for how long this message is, but I just wanted to tell you that we have a charity, or I'm sorry, they have a charity the family does every year with money out of their own pocket for Christmas and Thanksgiving. Last year, they did 100 Thanksgiving baskets uh, full of food for families that are less fortunate, 50 Christmas baskets full of toys and food for families in memory of their son and what he would have wanted. Man, I was trying to power through. Uh, this year, they've gotten everyone's help uh, with pledging 105 families for Thanksgiving to fill with baskets. Uh, this is all done out of Washington for families. Whew, man, this shit is tough. They live uh, with no way of making the holidays for their families. They don't ask for money. They just want to bring the SUDC to everyone's attention. Please look at the link I have put in this email and know that there are people out there that care enough for others. It's Facebook. It's facebook.com, Aiden's Heroes. We're going to put that in today's episode description. Thanks for sending that in, Jared. Thanks for your service. Thanks for sharing what you and your friends have done to let their child live on a memory and in the service uh, of others. Yeah, again, putting that link in the episode description. Man, yeah, we uh, family shed some tears last night talking about this over dinner. Uh, you know, please thank your friends on behalf of Time Suck for taking such a tragic event using it as a way to improve the lives of others who would otherwise go without during the holidays. You're a good meat sack, man. They are Portland, Oregon area suckers. Uh, if you have time to donate, click the link. You can help give out baskets. Uh, you guys are the fucking best. Thanks for being awesome. Add joy to this world of ours. Love how special this community is. And, uh, and I had to put another message just to, ah, to lighten things back up because this kind of emotion does not feel good in my, in my head. Okay. Uh, gonna light things up, leave on some laughs uh, given to us by Time Sucker Andy Brown. Andy writes, Hey, fucker, uh, you got me banned from Target. I typically listen to podcasts when I shop errands or, or, or while I shop and run errands. Uh, I just happened to be listening to the Church of Satan while I was at Target shopping for pajamas for our youngest son. Some quick and vital information. I grew up as, par as part of a traveling circus act. My family trained animals for a relatively successful regional circus. A lot of my important life moments happened while on the road. I learned to ride a bike, learned how to build stuff, and more, all while being part of the circus. My first sexual encounter also happened on the road. There was another family that traveled with the circus. They were gymnasts. When I was 15, the oldest daughter was 18, extremely beautiful, very flexible. I was very hormonal and excitable. Our RVs were often parked near each other, and the gymnast hottie would often undress in front of an open window that faced my room. Uh, she knew I was attracted to her because our stupid uh, leotard outfits did little to conceal my boners. Be gone, Lucifina. <laughs> Anyways, after a few weeks of teasing me, she asked her, uh, she asked if I would help her practice one night. Uh, most of the adults were gone for the evening, so we had the site almost to ourselves. Turns out practicing meant rubbing naughty bits against each other. 
as things were starting getting hot and heavy, we realized, we realized we weren't totally alone. The guy who played the music, specifically Calliope, began to practice his bit. At about this time, it was go time, if you know what I mean. The rest of that summer, her and I would fuck like rabbits, hail Lucifina. For some reason, the sound of the Calliope made the climax so much more intense. <laughs> the summer ended. She went away to college. Though it sounds weird, the sound of a Calliope has a sexual attachment to me. Back to now. The gymnast recently friended me on Facebook, and my God, she's even hotter. She's been on my mind a lot lately. So as I'm trying to fight, find the right size pair of PJ mask jammies, uh, mask jammies, you played the gosh dang calliope. With that girl in my mind and the erotic sounds of the calliope in my ears, I began to uncontrollably ejaculate in my khaki pants. I'm talking a full body convulsion jizzing in the kitty pajama section of Target. Needless to say, the store security officer told me that if I ever come back, I will be arrested. So thank you, Daniel. None of that is true. I just wanted to get you back for getting me with what a fool believes during the Revolutionary War suck. <laughs> Keep on sucking. And if you're still reading, can you give a quick shout out to my buddy, Tyler? Hey, Tyler, what's up, you son of a bitch? Uh, take care, suck master. Ah, well, thank you, Andy. I needed that. Uh, the first time I read it, you did get me. Uh, well played, young Jedi. Oh my God, I thought you were such a maniac for a bit there. I was like, man, the Calliope made you come? I thought, I thought it was a bit, a bit much, but I did buy it. Big on Lucifina. Why do you allow me to be tricked like that? But thank you for uh, letting me know that the uh, What a Fool Believes uh, got you and for getting that stuck in my head again because it's a great song. makes me smile. And now let me get some Calliope uh, stuck back in your head, right? Because, I mean, you do clearly love the music. <laughs> Thanks for listening, kiddos. Sorry to say Cotton Candy won't be hitting the stage tonight. She's a bit too itchy to dance for your entertainment this evening. The Lobster Boy gave her a bad case of the crabs. <laughs> Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. That's all for this week, Meat Sacks. For fuck's sake, don't do anything horrific to cats or dogs or women. And maybe don't take the strap to anyone. It seems excessive. And in the words of the bearded lady I went on a date with just last night, <laughs> keep on sucking! <laughs> hey! So do you think he was kind of like, like was like this? Like, I don't like it. I'm tired of getting picked on. I'm strong. I, I'm so strong. I think you got to be careful. I mean, because if these are sharp. Oh, yeah. You want to make sure you like probably wrap the, at least the front paws in there. Oh, then, oh God, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm strong yeah. and you can't hurt me. I get that. I yeah. get that. So something like that. Do you, do you think that maybe we're thinking about this too much? <laughs> <laughs>